DJ Carey, the Dodger himself. After him there was Ollie Baker, DJ steadying himself, turning it in beautifully and putting it over the bar, and he's now got a goal and four points. That's a fantastic this moment of magic by Kilkenny's DJ Carey in the 2002 All-Ireland Hodling Final typifies the hardling skill of the county with an unrivaled tradition and love of the national game as they powered their way to their 27th All-Ireland senior hardling title. The modern story of Kilkenny hardling begins in Tullerone, North Kilkenny, the 1st of November 1884, where three young men, Ned Tehan, Jack Hoyne and Henry J. Maher, on the invitation of Michael Cusick, headed for Hayes' Hotel in Thurles. Ned played in six All-Irelands before Kilkenny won an All-Ireland. Jack Hine was on the first winning All-Ireland team in 1904. They accompanied Henry Marr to Thurles in a pony and trap. Um, there was a trophy won outright here by Tullerone on behalf of Kilkenny in 1902. And it was presented to, to Laurie's father, uh, Henry, in recognition of his work for the GA and, par and as well he was being a founder member. And the, uh, a lot of people think that that trophy is associated with Laurie, but Laurie would have only been four years of age when it was presented to his father. Tullerone, captain by James Grace, won the first county hurling championship by beating Moon Coyne in the county final in April of 1887. They were well beaten in the All-Ireland semi-final by Thurlis, who went on to win the first All-Ireland hurling final. The GAA and the Land League were closely interwoven in the 1880s. Hardling and football matches were ideal meeting places for political meetings, despite the concerted efforts of the RIC. They were all Irishmen, but were paid by Britain. And they had, they suspected, and I suppose they had reason to suspect, that the, the GA and the Hurlers was fostering the subversive movement. I know several Holland pitches around, around Tullerone here, up a plateau on top of the hill, a big flat field on top of the hill, and that's where they played. And the, the lookouts would stay, and the police would be seen coming up there, and they'd be all gone. The boys would be gone, they'd be vanished. In 1888, county champions Moon Coyne became Leinster champions. Later in the year, however, the championships were interrupted and eventually abandoned because of the US invasion. This was an exhibition party organised by Morris Dabben that played a number of matches to help establish the GAA in America. 
Michael Cotton from Castle Comer, and John Fox from Moon Coyne were joined by James Grace from Tullerone on the tour. With the establishment of the GAA and the success of Charles Stuart Parnell's parliamentary party, the 1880s was a wonderful decade for nationalism. The three Fs, fair rent, free sale and fixity of tenure were conceded in 1881. And by February 1890, when Parnell was cleared of terrorism charges, the uncrowned King of Ireland was at the height of his power. Within a few short months, however, triumph quickly turned to tragedy, when following a sensational divorce case, Parnell was named as correspondent by Captain O'Shea in his wife's adultery. He electioneered around Tullerone and one of the houses he came to was our house because of, of my grandfather. The Land League came into being and my grandfather founded it here in Kilkenny and my grandmother was secretary of it. On the morning he left, my poor mother was Dorf Welsh and her sister was Cecilia Welsh and Anne Welsh, three sisters. And he gave them a medal apiece that they were after bringing out. And I, I have that medal. By 1893, however, the influence of the GAA in particular would help heal the split. And over the next ten years, Kilkenny would appear in five All-Ireland finals. They lost all five, but in 1904, Tullerone made the vital breakthrough by beating the legendary Rockies and All-Ireland champions Black Rock of Cork won 9 to 1 8 in the final. This was the start of Kilkenny's greatest hurling era, when they won seven titles in ten years and could have won another four. The 1906 Leinster final was lost by having to play without the Tullerone men because of a dispute over the goalkeeper. And in the 1914 Leinster final against Leash, Kilkenny got what seemed a perfect winning goal near the end, but when spectators invaded the pitch, the referee disallowed the score. It may have been some consolation to Kilkenny that year that Moon Coyne's Bob O'Keefe was a guiding light in Leash Hurling. There was a Bob O'Keefe who was from Glen Grant, Moon Coyne, and he was a school teacher in Leash, and he became a Leinster chairman and president of the GAA. And the Leinster Trophy, which is the biggest trophy in GAA, is, is named after him. This is the village of Glen Grant. South Kilkenny, you couldn't go any farther, you jump out in the shoe up there. But all the houses across there, they were all attached. There were seven houses at one time, they had ten statues acres. Bob got his All Ireland medal when Leash had a sensational win over Cork in the 1915 final. He was near the end of his days at the time, and it was in full back he was playing. And the, like Michael O'Hare had said, the Shamazel was below and the cock goal because the ball came into him and when he poked it as hard as he could and rolled in the cock goal, nobody noticed it. Many of Kilkenny's legendary hurling records were set in that great era. Take the Dyle family of Munkine. They won 19 All-Irelands, 18 of them on the field of play and one as soap. You take the Graces of Tullerone, I think they won 14 All-Irelands as a family. And there was a drug wench of Munkine. He played uh, full-back with his club, Munkine, and he played centre-back with Kilkenny. Jack Ratchett was the full-back, he couldn't play full-back. But he played in seven All-Irelands, won the seven, captain three of them, and he never lost an All-Ireland. Naturally, Hodling had to take a back seat to political affairs in this period. The 1916 Rising, the death of Terence McSweeney on hunger strike in 1920 all caused delays and cancellations in the GAA calendar. There was a lot of confidence in the political process when de Valera went to London in January 1921. Great excitement for the arrival of a visitor to the Prime Minister from Unhappy Island. During the meeting, prayers in the streets for an agreement. What happened in that de Valera discussion, who can say but himself? But though he opposed petition to the hilt, that was the time the Irish Free State was born. The treaty and the first Doyle in January 1922 didn't bring the much desired peace. The GAA calendar was again seriously disrupted by the Civil War. The shooting of Michael Collins at Bail and Law cast a shadow across the country. On this lovely sunny morning, I was going up to work. That I get for the paper. And I saw this man in uniform coming down the road 
and he was in pain. He was wobbling a bit. But the only farmers wasn't a nice thing to see at that time, you know, and they were a bit frightening too. And uh, I got a bit uh, nervy, if you like, but when he came up to me and he put up the big hands and he said, he stopped me and I got off the bike, I said, it was the best thing to do. And he said to me, Dad, he said, did you hear the news? And I said, I didn't, Charles, I didn't hear the news. I knew who he was. But I didn't hear the news. Did we? He said, they killed the big fella, he said, yesterday evening. And of course, the big fella, that's what he used to call the cousins. And he told me that I was in. And the tears were coming down his eyes. They said that time, and I thought everything went terribly quiet. But what they said at that time, when the news of Collins that came, the boat stopped singing. Now that was the way that was that was the way that Collins uh, was regarded by most people. Kilkenny had beaten Dublin in the 1922 Leinster final and went into collective training for the delayed All Ireland final against Tipperary in August 1923. The team was trained by Paddy Icy Lanigan and Mick Dalton. A huge crowd watched a very exciting final. Tipperary were leading with three minutes to go, but Paddy Donoghue and Dick Tobin with a goal apiece sealed the issue for Kilkenny. What he done for you was the captain of the team that beat uh, Tipperary in the All Ireland final, and uh, Tommy Carroll from Poor Rowan was also on that team. And then what he went on to become uh, as captain of the, uh, the first Kilkenny captain to bring home the Railway Cup in 19. 27, and of course I mustn't forget his brother uh, Eddie was full forward on the 1922 team. Kilkenny beat Leash in the 1923 Leinster final and met Galway in the All-Ireland semi-final. Both teams stayed in Barry's Hotel on the Saturday night. And who came in were five or six of the Kilkenny players and the captain. Dick Grace was in there and he was the principal speaker and he was telling them how he was going to retire after the All Ireland and uh, settle down and get married and get out of Holland. And Dick Morris, he gave me an elbow and he said, Did you hear that? He said, I did. I said, He didn't say it all. He says, For All Ireland, he'd retire after. By him, he won't be in this spot. <laughs> well, God, we better show them next day. Uh, three goals and ten pints to six pints. That was the score. No. Well, so that man was rightly out of his opinion. Kilkenny helped by five goals from John Roberts beat Galway in the 1926 semi final in Croke Park. Kilkenny's final opponents, Cork, had to meet Tipperary three times to decide the issue in Munster. There was three miles fallen in 26. Bill was playing cornerback. Nori was playing centre field. And Henry was playing full forward. And Bill Mart cleared the ball. And Nori connected with him. And Henry drove it over the bar in 26. And Cock beat the lard out of Kilkenny. Henry Maher then went to the USA, but returned to play with the United States team against an Ireland selection in the Thalton Games in 1928. A noticeable feature of Kilkenny hurling is the number of hurling dynasties that exist across the county. We were after putting the, the cattle on the rail above and came back down the town and who did we meet on Little Sim? That was Captain Sim. My father himself was very great and went into Jimmy Connell's here in High Street. And who arrived in after him? Only Jack Rashford. And so Ratchford was down full back, a pal of theirs again. Ratchford said to Little Sim, God damn it, only for us, Wharton, you'd have there a hurler. That's the way he said, Wharton. That's the way you're putting it. Only for us, you'd have near a hurler. Oh, boy, boy, what do you mean? Why should we send up all the Jones? Jones was the greatest mother, the white mother, the Mars mother, the crushes mother. Royal Jones, all sister. 
1931, Kilkenny were back in the All-Ireland final again. The final against Cork caught the imagination of the country by going to a second replay. Uh, Laurie was captain also in 1931, uh, and the second day he, he got a rather bad injury, three broken ribs, and he missed out on the third day. And Anyway, he made amends in 33 and 35. Wales is were new, comparatively new, and this postman, Bill Muldowney, he lived out there beyond. I'd show you the place, just across the road. And he had, he made up his own wireless. He was, he was very clever. My mother bought a red Gansey. You don't hear much about Gansies now at the present time, which was a red Gansey. Fishermen wear them a lot. But it was the red for colours for cock anyway. And uh, we all did crowd down to O'Connell's. They had the uh, weather set. And I remember quite I was up in the halfway of the banisters of the stairs listening to the and there'd be long pauses and he wouldn't say anything. And himself and Lori Mar wasn't great at all. And in 1931, God, I said to, to a bush of mine, Tom Tain, I'd know his mouth wasn't at all. All of a sudden, full stop, the batteries failed. So we had to rush out and it was about uh, 200 yards down a man by the Teddy O'Brien had the world set out on the window and there was a huge crowd there at, 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 listening to it. So we sat down the grass. My father went off to the Ireland on Saturday evening along with the master. He was secretary of the Holland Club, Dan Brennan, a great master here. And, and when I got him gone, I, 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 I appealed to my mother and she consented and gave me her bike. And I wanted him to sit on the saddle, but I pedalled on the pedals into town and got there and got home safe. That particular day, I had five bob in my me, me pocket starting off. The train fare was a half a crown. It was a shilling to go into Cove Park and you had one and sixpence to spend. And that was, and you, you had a good day, but you got back about three o'clock in the morning. There was no such thing as timetables or anything like that. Did anyone hold in Cork pretty well that day? And a ball went down, went down the left wing. Okay, Kenny men went to for it one after the other. And whatever happened, the ball pushed the curtain. And Paddy Delay was in the corner, and Paddy Delay got it and scored a goal. That was the prudent point in the match. The 30s was a golden era for Kenny. Um, they were beaten, as you say, in 31 after two replays. Still the only All Ireland to go to two replays. And indeed, many people contend that that was the All Ireland final that made Hurling. Uh, came back then and won in 32, won in 33. And that 43 team was the first Kilkenny team to win the league in All Ireland double. And that team was captained by uh, Neddy Dyle of Wunghai, not related to the three other Dyles, but a uh, wonderful hurler. And uh, his son Noel uh, got, became a famous man in our club. And where we're standing here this evening, uh, the building in the background there uh, is, coming, is dedicated to the memory of the late Noel Dyle. You'd never be selected in Kilkenny if you were the best hurler in Europe and come from another county. They came here from Tipperary, the best men, and they, they win all Ireland from Tipperary. And they were holding with Dick Spurrow and James Stevens and all the rest. They were never... <laughs> it's strange. I don't know why now. I, I don't know what is the reason. But it's happened now. And facts are facts. The Kenny people are rattled with black and amber from the day they were born. And I always said that if fathers couldn't be inter-county hurlers, the first ambition they have for their kids is to be on the Kilkenny team. And like down the west of Ireland, there's an old saying that if we make Mary a nun and we'll make Paddy a priest and the rest of them can look after themselves. And in Kilkenny, that kind of whole religion scenario takes a different twist. In Kilkenny, it's we'll make him a centre forward and at worst he could be a corner back. The following year, Kilkenny beat Dublin in the Leinster final. Clare, who had lost the Munster finals of 27, 28 and 30, finally made the big breakthrough by beating Cork, the All-Ireland champions. And then they met Galway, a very handy Galway team in the um, Gaelic grounds in Limerick. At half-time, there's varying reports, we were 15 points down, we were 13 points down, but we were certainly down three or four goals. Paul Considine started and they could, he kept throwing balls into the net like nobody's business. And Clare won the match. 
I think there was a record close something around 30,000 at, at the final against Kilkenny. Kilkenny were a blend of Lowry Maher, the experience of Lowry Maher, and maybe some more youthful players. And uh, in a very tight first half, again, Tommy Daly reports indicate kept us in the match. Player led by a point at half time. Three subsequent goals seemed to send Kilkenny on their way. But Clare rallied. With two minutes to go, Tull again plucked the ball out of the sky. And there are two versions. One, that he was pushed in the back, which was obviously the Clare version. But the Kilkenny version was that he got this superb uh, shoulder, which just knocked him off the ball, and the ball trickled out wide, and uh, Kilkenny broke up feed and scored the third point, which won the match. In 1933, Kilkenny won their first league final against Limerick, and also beat the Shannon Siders in the All-Ireland final. A great goal by lovely Johnny Dunn was the difference between the teams. Kilkenny beat Offaly, Leash and Galway on the way to meeting Limerick in the 1935 final. Kilkenny held on to win by one point in a downpour. A record crowd of 51,000 packs Dublin's great stadium for the big day of the Irish hurling year. The same two clubs as last year are fighting out the final. Limerick nearest the crowds and Kilkenny. And last year Kilkenny won. But they only managed it by one point, so this year it looks as if the fight will be tougher than ever. Right from the start, Kilkenny attack. And within three minutes, they're one point up. But Limerick fight back, and the end comes with Limerick winners by five goals and six points to Kilkenny's one goal and five. Kilkenny got to the final again in 1937. This time the final was played in Killarney, as the Cusick stand was being built, and completion was delayed because of a strike. Over 44,000 people at the Fitzgerald Stadium watched the senior All-Ireland hurling final. The occasion is rather an historic one. It marks the close of the 50th championship and the first time the final has been played outside Croke Park for 30 years. The tussle is between Tipperary and Kilkenny. Now they come on in the, in the, in the, in the match in Killarney. I said, there's nothing you could do. It was a wonderful striker. I couldn't ever recall him striking a ball wrong. Sure, he was only ever hooked or blocked. He did those drive it wider over the bar. Tipperary are fielding the team which defeated Limerick in the Munster final, and possibly for that reason, they show that they're the superior side. Tipperary forced the pace from the throw-in, and for a time there's promise of a close struggle. But when the Tipperary forwards find their range, they gradually take the upper hand, and they run up an interval lead of 12 points. We had a, a unique type of house, a two-storey attached house, and we'd, we hadn't any great use for it. And, uh, we, we even thought of selling it at one stage, and my solicitor, I suppose, was pretty good. He said to me, he says, can you be farming there and see somebody passing up and down by your like, would that work? And I think that was the clin clinching point, and I, I decided that whatever we do, we'd hold on to it. When I did take the decision to pass it on to a company, uh, uh, it was with the provision that it be a memorial to all hurlers, and I specified hurlers, like coming from the parish of Tullerone, we had uh, with a lot of people that were worthy of, of being remembered, and Moan Kine and Three Castles and all the great centres of hurling, in, but in general it meant all hurlers. The leader programme was, the, was very much the, being spoken about at that time. Money from Europe, of all places, like Laurie would have laughed at that. Kilkenny reversed at the 1938 Leinster final result against Dublin and met Cork in the Thunder and Lightning final of 1939 on the weekend that World War II began. Nobody in Cork Park or nobody in, in the Kilkenny team knew anything about the war. Couldn't care less. No. Normally Kilkenny would stay in the Castle Hotel because they had their home in the Castle Hotel, O'Connor. He was from Lisbon, but he was married to a girl from Moonkine. Now, at this, during the war years, everything was scarce. But he had everything, you know. He had bread, he had meat, he had everything. We were sitting on the side there, and the rain, the rain uh, came down in buckets from the front. Then the thunder and the lightning came. We felt we had to run. The black and amber just ran into each other, you know, and ran down into the tugs. The ball broke and got going early on. Then after a while, a big high ball came in. There were three or four around it. And I was looking out to flick it back. You know, when you, when you head in, you know. And then starting off when the ball was thrown in for the second uh, half, uh, I got the ball from the throw in and scored the goal, a pint at the, the railway. And, and I remember when Jimmy Welch coming, he got to say, I didn't think he could eat the ball that far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Mm. Kirk Fitt is a great, the, the, the great sportsman. Great, I must say that about the great sportsman. And if you're a sportsman, they take you to the hat. They tell you what 64 against. So I, I, God, I was ashamed into taking bets. Took, took too many bets in it. Jimmy Barry Murphy had a, had, had, had a, a bet of 60 to, 60 to 40. He wanted me to take it, but I couldn't. They said they'd take half. And said, no, he didn't. So they came up then on the Saturday evening, they came up to Kilkenny and they got the bet on in Kilkenny and Dan Ballard. And then they got the whole 60 to 40 on, of course, as they did the last one. <coughs> but I won £102 on the, <laughs> on the day. I never saw a pool day after. I thought I wouldn't anyhow. 1940 brought Kilkenny and Limerick together again for the fourth final meeting in this era. The moving of Mick Mackey to midfield was the turning point and Limerick went on to win by six points and Kilkenny's second golden era had come to an end. In the ten-year spell, from 1931 to 1940, they won eight Leinster titles and four All-Irelands. For their coach, Danny O'Connell, 1939 was his 11th success with the team over a 35-year spell stretching back to their first win in 1904. Kilkenny lost the 1945 All-Ireland to Tipperary and played Cork in the great finals of 46 and 47. I'm not sure I was picked for centre-back to play upon Christy Ring, which I played I never played. I'm not sure I had a plan in gold. <laughs> I'm so glad to get on. When you pick up a ball and not one time, you don't know where, where you're bound for. But anyway, I picked it up and I started to run. And eventually I found that I was in a... that uh, I had shaken off most of my opponents, but I was in the wrong place. So then I said I could... I changed my mind and came across the goal. I said, went to the roof, you know, I said, you know. Ah, sure, I suppose maybe I hold them fair enough up till the last minute. He scored a goal after me and they changed me then. Brought me to the middle of the field and put Dan Kendi back on him. And he scored, I think, a goal and a few points off of Kendi. And I'd say that kept me on the team. That was the day Ring came into his own, in my opinion, in 46. He cut loose in the second half, plus a number of others as well. He mightn't have got all the scores, but he made most of them and we won comfortably in the end. I started with the heroic senior team and I played with them for a while and I was selected on the senior hurling team then and I had great pleasant memories, I'd say, from 45 to 50 with the Kilkenny team, you know. 46 couldn't compare at all with it, in my opinion, for the pace of the game and the range of hurling that was in it. Because Kilkenny, as you know, were terribly skillful. You had Langton, Mulcahy, Lahey, all these fellas. They were great players. I went down in one knee anyway, and the ref, who was Phil Porson at Tipperary, blew the whistle and a free in, and it wasn't a free at all, so he never touched me. Lahey came up and put it over the bar, and I think that was the level and point. No, I'm not sure. Cork scored two goals late in the game, went ahead. Went ahead twice and Kilkenny fought back and won it. Uh, Terry Lahey scored the, the, the equaliser and the winning point. It's something that will remain in a youngster's mind for all time. I did get a bus from Enniscorthy to Ferry Bridge, just this side of New Ross. And I cycled from there to Thomastown and get the tra bus in, the train in from Thomastown to Kilkenny. And on the Sunday then, I played the match. Sometimes I think it was most times in Kilkenny, but you could go to Callan or Thomastown. And when that was over, I'd come home, have me tea, and then I'd cycle back to Enniscorthy, which was 35 miles. Lee shocked Kilkenny in 48 and 49, but Kilkenny got to both the league final and the All Ireland final against Tipperary in 1950. The greatest display of hurling I ever saw by a Kilkenny man was by Shem Downey against. Tipperary in the league final of 1950. He was playing on Sean Kenny. The heading on the newspapers of some of them the next day was, if ever a man deserved a trip to America, twas Shem Downey. Come on then, and they all Ireland and put me back in the middle of the field again, and I said, right, they never strikes in the one place twice, I said. It's not going to happen, I said, if I'm going to do the same thing, 
So they changed me back to center forward. Yes, here they come, the men of Kilkenny in their black and amber, the lads from Tipperary in their blue and gold. And as the teams parade, one enthusiastic supporter puts the crown on Tipperary's captain, Sean Kenny, who wears it on the Kildare side. A high ball would be coming in out of the sky, right? And it was legal that time with the rules. The forwards could charge in before the ball, and they could have the goalie hanging it in in the back lap before the ball had come on. Well, so it was up to the backmen to keep out the forwards. And introduced to the captain and referee, Con Murphy. And as the team stand to attention, the band strikes up our own the Vian. The Orel final was a bit of an anti-climax. And, and we were far superior to Tip in that game and still still beat and missed some frees and things like that. And one nine, one eight. Lahi came in. Lahi came in at the back of the goal. They were after getting there was after being a goal got a, a goal. So Lahi had be in he'd always been in and you know and he'd say, oh boys, you want to be dropping the blade another couple of inches, he'd say. At this stage, a canine spectator, finding his view obscured, took up a midfield berth, but is escorted to the sideline. Tip launched another attack, only to find Pendergast and Shem Downey as staunch opponents. The Premier County is hard to dishearten, and once again they rally, but as the scores mount on both sides, the Kilkenny men have, if anything, the better of the exchanges. Diamond Hayden is tackled by Sonny Marr and Jimmy Kennedy, who in turn has to give best to Prendergast. Diamond story, the local common went up to Dal Earn uh, and they brought on the diamond. You brought the diamond wherever. The diamond was your ticket into an awful lot of places. Highly respected man, of course. John Wilson came across the forecourt of Leinster House and he said, diamond, he said, the boss wants to see you. Now the boss at the time was God be good to him, Jack Lynch. That was a quarter to three. To the best of my knowledge, at 20 to 10 that evening, with the bus still waiting, the leader of our country, and probably the most respected politician we've ever had, the great Jack Lynch and the Diamond Hayden, came arm in arm across the forecourt of Leinster House, and our Taoiseach deposited the full back in 1947 on the Callan bus and said to the boys, you can take him home now. They thought the way Kilkenny performed in 47 that they were in for a, 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 a couple of all Ireland which the way the thing ran that time was Tip won three and Cork come along in 52, 53 and 54 and Wexford came along and won in 55 and 56. The most peculiar thing about it was that I never played on a losing Kilkenny team against Wexford in a Leinster final. We beat them every time and won no all Ireland. The crowd gathers round the Hogan stand as GA President Michal Kyo presents the cups to Sean Kenny, the Tipperary senior captain, and to young Lennon, the Kilkenny minor captain. And so ends yet another spectacular chapter in the glorious history of Ireland's national game of hurling, my who Tipperadar and August Kilkenny. It's hard to compare, compare it, like, you know. Sure, every fella thinks his own crowd the whitest, doesn't he? We, we, we said we were better rollers than the lads today. <laughs> You know, but there wasn't there weren't, there weren't many G DJ Careys around that time, my time. Now Langton would be the nearest to it, and, and, and possibly uh, Terry Lahey. You know, but Langton wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't do the things that uh, DJ would do now. Langton was always you were holding beside the man, you were bullocking for him, and Mulcahy was at one side, and I was at another side, the other wing, you know, and Mulcahy was a bullocker, and so was I. And, You'd, you'd pass the ball possibly to Langton, he'd put it over the bar, no question about it, you know. I went at him on my own in 61. There's two places to get the best ash of all, and that's ditch ash or ash grown near a stream. Because ash, ash takes an awful amount of water. The best uh, um, age for hurley ash is 35 years. It's a bit too young under 30, and when it goes over 40, it's a bit too old. If you haven't 
a certain amount of weight in the plank. You could be nodding your head at it. Tony Warley Tibrary and Christy Ringer Cork. You couldn't have them heavy enough for him. I remember Christy asked me to make a hurley for him and I said, Christy, what way do you want it? Oh, he says, Remy, he says, leave all the timber you like, and he says, I'll swing it. Why not join the crowds converging on Dublin on Sunday, September the 6th, 1953, for the hurling final? Between Galway got to the first of their three final appearances at the 50s by virtue of a fortuitous win over Kilkenny in the 53 semi-final in Ball. With about a minute to go, and Jimmy Langton got a 21 yards free, they stayed in front of the goal, so everyone thought he was going to just tap it over for a point for the equaliser, but he went for a goal, and the ball was saved by Sean or Colum Carlis, and cleared out the field, and the full time was to win, so we were in an all Ireland final, which was a great achievement. That was my last time to, to, to play for the county. I might have been a sub, maybe in 54. As well as creating records on the hurling fields, Kilkenny has a proud tradition in Camogie. You no, know, lad said to me, God, you trained them well. I brought them to matches. I bought them a hurl. They played in 30 in all Ireland and won 12. Angela played in the first one and Andrew was a sub. Got into trouble, of course, too. Told the lady one day in order to get her whisked in her mouth again. <laughs> I got three months for it. <laughs> Kilkenny got to the All Ireland hurling final again in 1957 against Waterford, but they were lucky to beat Dublin in the first round. Kevin Heffernan got a loose ball, and I'd say I believe I was the nearest back to him. I wasn't marking, but it was the nearest to him, and I went to go to him. But he must have realised that time was up, and he steadied himself, and he over delayed hitting the ball to make absolutely sure. And Brian Smith, who was refereeing, blew the blew it full time. Fifty seven created a new rapport, call it what you will, a new kind of an arrangement between Waterford and Kilkenny. We were now it was now a rivalry of equals. They were making the film called Rooney, and John Gregson was the star. And it was about a Dublin dustbin man who was a horror and played with Dublin in the North Ireland final. Paddy O'Keefe sent word that this film star would be in Croke Park the following day and he was putting him in the Waterford dressing room. I felt like that we had enough without that distraction and that interference, as it turned out, it would have been a great thing. They came to Kilkenny anyway, to Paddy Grace, and sure, Paddy Grace was a great man of reading any situation. Let him in here to him, he said. There'll, there'll be a lot of tension in the dressing room, he said, in the run-up to the match. And he'll be in there and they'll be looking at this fellow and they'll be wondering what he's about and they'll be talking about him and they'll be out hurling before they know what's happened, he said, and there'll be no tension. And then in the parade, he slipped in between myself and Sean Clossy, I think, in the parade. He just stepped in out of the edge of the crowd, into the parade and paraded around with us. We paraded with 16 men. And the men of Kilkenny in their striped black and amber jerseys. Dennis Heaslop gets the ball on the wing. Into his hand and over the bar. Waterford are hurling really wonderful stuff, and Frankie Walsh increases their lead. Back come Kilkenny. Billy Dwyer gets the ball, works his way past the backs, and soon that ball is in the back of the Waterford net. Mickey Kelly sends the ball to Mick Kenny, and the ball is crashing to the net for a goal that changes the whole complexion of the game. And seconds later, Mikey Kelly, the captain, sends over the point that makes Kilkenny the champions with the score 4-10 to 3-12. The Kilkenny captain is chaired off the field with the Cup of Championship honour. Paddy Grace was an outstanding character, really. Like, you know, an, an outstanding... You could read the situation. Great camaraderie with the players. If a player had a problem, Paddy Grace would solve it. Uh, we went to a league match in Cork, and two lads kind of were going to Dublin and they were with a car of other people going in. The car went without him and the following day, where did they go? They went to Grace's. Is he there, Maureen? He was there. We haven't a bob. Where can we, how can we get back to Dublin? And Paddy was there to take care. After losing to Tipperary in the 58 semi-final, Kilkenny were back in the final again with Waterford in 1959. A sideline puck comes to Billy Dwyer and in he goes for Kilkenny's first point.
But the expressions on these faces show that Kilkenny are now in front with only two minutes to go. Here it comes. Larry Guinan to Seamus Power. He shoots. It's a goal. The equaliser. The day is saved for water. Good Lord, it looked as if they'd gone from us with, with time running out and not a, not a hope. Of, a matter of fact, uh, Paulie thought he had won the game with the goal instead of which was a draw. He struck it in and uh, the link Welsh who was full back, I suppose he, he went to go parry it or block it instinctively and it glanced off his hurley into the net and if he hadn't touched it I think Ollie would have had it down at the 21 at the other end and we'd have won that day too. Earlier in the day Kilkenny lost the minor final to Tipperary. One of the Kilkenny forwards was drafted onto the senior team for the replay. All the stars are not Tipperary lads either. See the dash and craft of Kilkenny's Eddie Kerr. Then I was brought on the panel for the replay and um, I got my chance to go in uh, in, the, in the final in 59. Then Mickey Walsh sends the sideline puck into the goal mouth. He slip rushes in, he shoots, it's a goal. Kilkenny are four points in front. Can nobody stop Tom Cheesty? This a shot of his is saved, but rushing in, he connects again to crash Waterford into the lead. But there was that fear. Could they conjure something out of nothing and, and, and do it again? But now I know we were clearly on top, clearly superior, undoubtedly. As a matter of fact, that was the only time, I think, uh, that, the, you know, the, the, the man of the match in those days was, was an, an Irish independent thing. And what they had was the team. The entire team got the man of the match award. 37,000 turned out to see Wexford beat Kilkenny in the Oireachtas final in October. Wexford would also come out on top in the 1960 Leinster final. Hope see it again in all clear of its cool Lake Kilkenya. While Tipperary might have been the dominant senior hurling team in the early 60s, the Kilkenny Miners were setting the headlines at underage. Later scoring power is their forwards. Freeney, Welsh, Barry, Aylward, Delaney and Kinsella all having a hand in building up a winning total to which Tipperary could only reply through two scorers Keating and the accurate... Kilkenny won the first minor in 1931. They won two more in that decade and they didn't win another one until 1950. We won in 1960, 61 and 62. Thomas man Billy Grace captained the team, Paddy Dempsey was on goal and John Murphy and Mickey Kelly were on the panel. After winning the 62 final, and I was living in Dublin at the time, we traditionally went back to Kilkenny for the reception. And I thought this was natural, like, you know, I didn't think of work on Monday, I needn't tell you. Uh, came back on Wednesday, one of the floor managers called me into the office and he said, look at, he said, um, there's a Monday and a Tuesday in this week, like, you know what I mean? So where the heck were you? After a while I said, look at, I'll, I think I'll move on. And there was a great old friend uh, who worked with uh, Ben Dunn Senior, a man called Dan Dunn, no relation, and he played on the three draws for the Kilkenny team, and he was like a grandfather to me, and he was very upset that I was going to leave. But anyway, I left. But when I was leaving, I asked to see Mr Dunn himself, and I went up uh, to the office, and he was very kind to me, as he always was, and he sat me down. He said, as the chat went on, he said, I hear you're fairly handy with the hurl, Tom. And he said, I'll give you one little bit of advice, he said. Uh, he said, however good you are on a Sunday, there's always a Monday to start the working week. I was beginning to wonder whether we'd, we'd, we'd win anything, but we were fortunate to beat Cork in a league final in 62. And uh, I suppose uh, for us, and it was probably the last occasion, uh, major occasion, when the great Christy Ring was on the field and played at full forward that day. And, and as far as I remember, he scored a magnificent goal and uh, five or six points. Despite the 1962 league win, Kilkenny lost the Leinster final to Wexford. They reversed that result the following year and met their neighbours Waterford in the All-Ireland final. This was the third final meeting of the near neighbours in seven years. Kilkenny led by Seamus Clear, Ollie Walsh, Sean Clossy, Paddy Morden, Tracy Coogan and Dwyer. Waterford, led by Joe Condon, Tom Cunningham, Larry Guinan, John Barron, Mick Dempsey, Phil Grimes and Tom Cheesley. Now the like of Grimesy and Powley had, they, they were at the tail end and both played in the full forward line, having been in midfield up to that. They both played in the full forward. John Barron, who had been cornerback, played full forward. 
Dennis Heaslip is taken down, and the unerringly accurate Eddie Kerr shoots Kilkenny into a four-point lead. Kilkenny are in rampant mood. They storm back into attack, and this goal by Tom Walsh gives them a lead of 11 points. Seamus Clear, the Kilkenny captain, who played an outstanding part in the victory over a gallant and not too lucky Waterford team. He had some new fellas coming in, and it looked good too for the future, but 63 unfortunately marked the end of the era. The All Ireland champions had a 12 point win over Dublin in the 64 Leinster final. Tipperary, who had won the 61 and 62 finals, were their opposition in the final. Well upfield, in and it has gone over the bar. Oh, what a start! What a start! Jimmy Doyle racing for it, doesn't quite get there quick enough. Paddy, how Sean Buckley does. Sean Buckley up now to Tom Forrestall, and Forrestall going racing through. He's been chased by Tony Wall, he's still going through. A high one, and it's a good one, it's the point. Paddy Moran being chased by Mick Roach. Ted Carroll coming in now, getting the ball, and upfield a shortage puck to John Tian for Kilkenny. He just can't hold on to the ball there, and Tony Wall clears it down. Put it Sean Buckley, putting Kilkenny into the attack again. Tom Forrestall up to Tom Walsh, and the fairhead Walsh racing through, take his shot and send it over the bar. We got a drubbing in, in the All-Ireland final. Tip double scored us. I think it might have been 28 points to 14. Uh, give or take, but five goals have scored against us anyway. They had many great uh, performances in the 60s, but I, but I reckon 64 was actually the peak of their performances, and they really literally wiped us off the field. Paddy Moran, our tech card is beaten by Babs Keating, and Babs is shot from the halfway line. It's good, it's over the bar. And it comes out to Babs Keating, Babs Keating with a high dropping ball between Sean McLaughlin and Shaw Whelan again and Johnny Needham is in it, it's the goal! Wexford again were Kilkenny's downfall in the 65 Leinster final. Staples bottled up between two players and he gets in his delivery, well downfield to Wexford, to Joe Foley. Joe Foley out to Harper McGrath. Harper tries a quick one and sends it high and sends it over the bar! 1966 promised to be Kilkenny's year. In May they won the league and met a young Cork team who had struggled to come out of Munster in the All-Ireland final. The teams had met earlier in the league semi-final. Goals like this helped Kilkenny to a 12-point win. He clears it away up the field. Will Eddie Kerr get it? Eddie, 50 yards out, 40, 30, 21, 14, shot and goal. Your measurement of your success is September. But we won the league in 66. We won the Oireachtas in 66. We won the Leinster Championship. We were undefeated, really, coming to the All Ireland final. And we were meeting Cork, a young team. And this team of 66, we had played together, a lot of us had played together in 63, 64, got beaten in the Leinster Championship in 65. But, you know, the nucleus of the team were there. We were an experienced team. That was a team that was plucked out of the air, literally. We had a lot of very good young lads. We had the likes of Juddle Mac, Charlie McCarthy, Justin McCarthy, uh, Shawnee Barry. It, it's a great position to be in, a, in, in an All-Ireland final. Uh, the pressure was completely on Kilkenny. They had hammers, hammered us in the league semi-final and they were certainly expected to hammer us again in the All-Ireland final. And down here in front of us, something very unusual, a colour camera, a colour television camera, because a special recording of this game has been made for ABC's Wide World of Sport to be seen in the United States. I doubt very much if there was five people in Cork. Nowhere else would give given us a chance to beat Kilkenny. I remember full well going to the game in the uh, in the bus and a sing song actually started up, which I have never seen since or before that I had never see, never seen it either. Uh, a sing song started on the bus amongst the team going to the co Park, and you know everybody was in the right frame of mind. Eddie Kerr for Kilkenny from out on the far side, high and over the bar. Another point for Kilkenny scored by Eddie Kerr. Two five to ten points, just one point between them. Cork the leaders, eleven points to ten. And from the puck, it's a long one, way down the field. 
Jim Tracy's clearance is a short one, however, and John O'Halloran gets the ball for Cork from a very awkward angle, a high one, and the ball is in the net. It's a goal. It's a goal. And from where I saw it, anyway, uh, at the other end of the field, he hit a high shot up that looked like as if it was going over the bar, and it appeared to hit the top of the upright and drop down and into the net. And it's John Buckley with the ball now. A high ball across the goal mouth. Joe Dumpy trying to keep it in play. Paddy Barry blocks it and it goes to Dennis Murphy for Cork. And his game comes to Eddie Chair. Eddie, low and hard. Half locked down. Tom Walsh is the goal. It's a goal for the Kenny scored by Tom Walsh. Johnny Barry takes the free. And he's it's hit the upright. Come back in the play to John Bennett. John Bennett takes the shot and it's over the bar. Point for Cork in the dying moments of the game. And the score three goals and nine points for Cork, one goal and ten for Kilkenny. And there goes the final whistle. It just goes to show, I think, like that the team with a greater hunger will win. Maybe we were on paper the best team, but like it's on the field it matters. And Cork came out and again rocked his back that year and um, uh, comprehensively beat us. And we had a wonderful uh, medic, uh, a man called Dr. Kieran Cuddihy. And I think he used the same old adage. I think if he gave guys water and he said he had a mixture in it, they believe it. I think he may have given some of them an aspirin. I don't know. But it was, it was nothing. The highlight of the 67 League campaign was the three meetings between Kilkenny and Clare at the semi final stage. But waiting for his Pat Henderson. Pat Burkle can get out to Tom Walsh. Beautiful pass and a beautiful catch. 30 yards out. Tom collects the ball. Sends in a shot. And it's in the net. Wexford won the final by seven points and were in a strong position in the Leinster final. But a typical Kilkenny rally yielded three goals in one point and a ten point win. Set up another final appearance against Tipperary. Oh. The crouching Tipperary men waiting for it. It's low. It's blocked down by John Doyle. And it comes across into the centre, and it's a shot, a shot there that's very well blocked down by John O'Donoghue, and the clearance comes out to Paddy Moore, and Paddy Moore into the goal mouth, and it's a goal! It's a goal! <laughs> Theo English pulling on it, can't quite get it up the field, Mick Burns pulling on it, can't get it up the field either, John Tien scoops it down to Eddie Kerr, Eddie Kerr very quickly into his hand and high, and over the bar for a point for Kilkenny. John, the Kilkenny men rampant now, swallowing up the field as if the ball was stuck to his hurley. He takes his shot, and there's the equaliser. <laughs> Mick Lanigan gone back there, so is Theo English, and Theo English here and comes out to 50 yards out, but Paddy Moran gets it, and Paddy high into the goal match. Jaden Carey with the ball now, the ball knocked off his stick by Tom Walsh. Jim Lynch is in there, right the goal! Right the goal! The joy in Kilkenny was tempered by a serious eye injury to star forward Tom Welsh. You cannot believe uh, how many people came to me and wished me good luck and so on and so forth. And I mean, the night I went in after the game, I didn't realise how bad the injury was, but obviously my eye was, was uh, badly damaged and uh, had to be taken out as a result. Anyone who is a parent will understand that you take any hardship yourself, but you don't want your children to have to take it. And my, I know my parents were very hurt uh, and upset for me, not because of anything else, but uh, it wasn't to do with hurling, it was to do with my life. And, you know, you, l you look at the situation and say, well, he's ruined, he won't be able to do anything. And uh, then I had Angela, my uh, fiancée at the time, and she was marvellous, and her father, the late Paddy Grace, and Maureen, <clears throat> honestly, uh, when you have people like that on your side, things move on. John Dyle was going for his... Uh Nine dollar in the middle, like I can. We kind of bet him, we bet him that day, so it was great that way, like you know. So that is, you know, I'd say if you asked any of the Kilkenny players, I'd say in that time, I'd say like uh, that is to give the men like the most. <laughs> they used to go up that morning in the train, and the lads usually, usually used to play cards to relax. And when they arrived on the train, no one had cards, so they started playing pitch and toss in the corridor of the train. 
and Ollie won something anyway and he had a belt on the door like in excitement and drove his, drove his fist through the glass and pumped blood so they had to they had to wrap it up in a towel and they sort of secretly as far as you could brought him off to the matter hospital and of course he was told that there's no way he could play and he got I think three or four stitches inside and uh, many outside and it was bandaged up but as it turned out Ollie had the game of his life won the man of the match award and Texaco award and everything that was to be won that year Ollie Walsh what a mobbing he's getting from his supporters he's having a rougher time out there now and he's roaring his head off with excitement and jubilation Father Tommy Maher was I think at his very best in 67 for me. He, he was a professional in the art of coaching. I'd say he was the first professional team manager or coach. And in my view, he did an awful lot of, for, for hurling. Spent an awful lot of time with hurling and, and developing the skills of hurling and, and making you able to do the skills that little bit quicker. 1968 was Wexford's year. Kilkenny found awfully a handful in the 1969 Leinster final. Mick also a comparative newcomer to the Kilkenny scene of colours. Oh, a lovely cut right across the goal mouth, right into the corner. It's a goal! It's a goal for Kilkenny! And we wouldn't have won the Leinster final except for Delaney. We played awfully in the Leinster final, which was unusual. And they, I think the score was something like 13 points to three goals and something for Kilkenny. But uh, awfully should have beaten us that day. You're very lucky sometimes. I was a young lad coming up and I came in I was tremendously lucky come in with a very good team, a very good team. I was young, able to run, and Shamey, I came on and said to Shamey, who was an absolute star, but Shamey's knee had gone. Shamey, Shamey's knee went, so I was, I was able to run. I wasn't able to hurl as good as Shamey, but they were able to run, though. The All-Ireland final was a repeat of 66. And so, after a very slow start, Kilkenny had come round and won the All-Ireland title of 1969. And then there was an injury to Pat Delaney, uh, sort of a nasty injury. He got a bad head, head injury, which sort of deflated Cork, actually, as well as motivating Kilkenny. And it had a significant bearing on the game because we ploughed ahead from that on, and I think we won by seven or eight points in the end. The same two teams travelled to Wembley the following year. So what better exponents of this ancient and skillful game for the Wembley crowd than league champions Cork and All-Ireland champions Kilkenny? In spite of a marked resemblance, this sport has little to do with jolly hockey sticks. It's fast, tough and exciting. The scoring is similar to that in Gaelic football, using points and goals separately. Wexford again knocked out the All-Ireland champions in 1970. Kilkenny won the first 80-minute Leinster final in 1971 but were convincingly beaten by Tipperary in the final. We had a very good chance of beating them, but on the day, Tip got the vital scores and won out, which is, as you say, a very high-scoring game. And um, um, I suppose, I think the final, I think we were beaten by about three points in the end. I tell you, we were beaten by the worst Tip team that ever won in All-Ireland, and it was proven afterwards, so they didn't win one for 17 years afterwards. We just underraced them, and everything went wrong on the day. It seemed the queerest of things happening. I seen a ball going wide, all you walking out over it like that, but he hit a, hit a thud behind his heel and he, and he took it in. I couldn't believe it. Our name was never on that cup that day. With his red and white, well a great display by Noel Skeehan in the replay of the 72 Leinster final, and 17 points from Eddie Kerr in the semi-final against Galway, set up the third meeting between Cork and Kilkenny in seven years. Liam O'Brien across the would be pass over the far side of Kieran Purcell, but it's Tom Roach way up the field and Connor set it over the bar from 70 yards from his own goal. And it looked like the final nail in the coffin, but 
Kilkenny just rallied at that point and came back and put in, there was about, I think, 15 or 20 minutes to go, and we put in a tremendous run on. Only bit of hooking there by Frank Cummins, and a lovely bit of follow-up by Liam O'Brien. Liam O'Brien for Kilkenny up along the wing. Eddie Camp grabbing that ball into his left hand, and away he goes up the wing. A shot from way out the field. There goes! Oh, what a goal! What a goal! And this is Eddie Kerr. And that is Brian Murphy of Cork. But he's under pressure. Kieran Purcell with the ball now. Kieran working his way through. He's on the 21, the 14. He's fouled. And there's a free in for Kilkenny. What would you do, chum? Would you be satisfied with the point? You have a long time to go, or would you try for a goal? Here he comes, he's going for a goal! And he's got it! There he is, Eddie Kerr, two goals and five points of the total to his credit. Damon Morrissey now for Kilkenny from his own 55 again, not a long one. And it comes over to Frank Cummins, Frank Cummins going soloing up the field now. He's on the 50. It's 40, it's 30, it's 21, it's a shot, and it's a goal! It's a goal! Oh, what a goal! Frank Cummins has scored! All out to the centre of the field, Pat Henderson upfield to Eddie Kerr, a lovely touch over the head of the Corkman, and then getting the ball across to Kieran Purcell. Kieran Purcell from out the field, and it's another point for Kilkenny. I remember Cork had a very dangerous forward lane anyway, that was number one. <laughs> I suppose for three quarters of that game I saw a lot of the ball and for the last quarter I saw very little of it. Yeah. Didn't even think of the speech before the game, the week before the game or even during the game. Or uh, No, no, supporters don't give a damn what you say really. They wouldn't be listening to you anyway. Like, once you have the cup it's the main thing, like, you know. Kilkenny played in the next three finals, but injuries after the 73 Leinster final probably cost them the chance of matching Cork's unique four in a row of the 40s. Kilkenny played Wexford in the Leinster final that year and I would say it was the best display out of, I ever seen out of any Kilkenny team. There were certainties for all Ireland. What happened? Kerr got injured, Postal had his appendix out and who was Jim Tracy? Frank without the hurley again but found it very nicely to Liam O'Brien. Liam O'Brien in towards the goal. Mick Brennan going up for it. Gets into his hand. The shot that's high, but it's done. Yes, it's over the bar. It's over the bar. This is Sean Foley. Ball oh, as if stuck to his hurley. Now up to the wing to Joe McKenna. Joe getting up and bringing it down. He takes his shot and it's over the bar. This is Willie Moore. Hands it to Sean Foley. Intended pass there, they didn't go where it was intended. Liam O'Brien coming back. Liam O'Brien high and over the bar. And the sides are level again. Liam O'Donoghue for Limerick. Being chased now by Pat Henderson. Into the centre to Frankie Dolan. Frankie Dolan on the 21, on the 14. A shot and it's blocked down. No see it is bottled into the goal. The ball is in the net, but yes, it's the goal. It's went now, it's the referee, it's gone up, the ball is in the net, I don't know who scored it. The whole sport was... Limerick beat us now and that was it and, uh, you know, it's easy to say, you know, if we had everyone we might have won, but if we had everybody we might have got a bit more to it, so there's no point going on that way like about it. We're beaten. We were probably motivated by the fact that we were beaten in 73 and we were out to sort of, I suppose, the... The motivation in the camp was, you know, uh, we have a full team now, we've got to beat them, and, and we went out. And I suppose Limerick were at the psychological disadvantage going into 74 as well. And Pat Hartigan going down for that one. Willie Fitzpatrick now for Kilkenny. And it's the goal! It's a goal! Mick Brennan, the scorer! Mick Brennan, the scorer! And here it is again, Willie Fitzpatrick across the goal. And there it goes, kicked into the corner of the net. Nicely blocked and held off there by Eamon Cregan. That's Pat Delaney. And is this a penalty? Is this a penalty? It is. And he says it in the goal. And 
here it is again. Eddie Kerr bending, lifting, and crash into the top of the net. Pat Lawler. And Pat Delaney out in the half forward line again. With Keaton Purcell in on the full forward line. And they're trying these high. It's a goal! It's a goal! The low ball into the goal. Pat Delaney, the scorer. These low balls in towards the defense that likes them high. Here it is again. Pat Hartigan tries to get his hand to it, doesn't, and the ball dribbles between the legs of Seamus Horgan. And Kieran Purcell now. Over the bar, a point by Kieran Purcell, breaking away from the collateral authorities there with that ball and sending it over the bar. Any care now. And the way that man does it, he didn't even look to see where the ball was going. He knew it was going right over the bar. Nicky Orr to Pat Lawler. And there goes the final whistle. And Kilkenny are the All-Ireland champions of 1974. Deservedly so, brilliantly so, with the score. Three goals and 19 points to Limerick. One goal and 13. Kilkenny won a record fifth Leinster final in a row in 1975. In the eyes of the Wexford defenders, and Liam misses it. Second goal. And this is Frank Cummins. And that's a point. Very quick point. And that's Colm Dorn. And this is Frank Cummins for Kilkenny. Pat Delaney in there with Willie Murphy. It's just hit the post, it's gone in, yes it's in. This is Colm Dorn, he's moved in centre half back. This is John Murphy for Wexford. John Murphy being upended there by Tom McCormick, but this is Tony Dorn again. Tony Dorn. And that's Kieran Purcell doing it again, catching that one out of the air. And sending a magnificent point. Magnificent game by this man, Purcell. That's his third point. Kilkenny had now won three of the last four All Ireland finals. They met league champions Galway in the first 70 minute final. Galway played terrible well, terrible well against Cork in the semi final. We were All Ireland. And, and, uh, and Matthew Five was in the Cork dressing room after it, and they were fierce down, you know. And they were saying to me, you'll never be at Galway. I said, I said, you're probably right. I said, I said, you know, we, <laughs> we said, I was talking to Damien, Damien McElroy, he was a reporter. He collared me coming out and he said to me, see, what do you think of Galway? I said, yes, I have a great team. I said, we'll never be at him, you know. But we were, we worked hard on it. But we, Galway was after betting us in the league semi-final, or in the semi-final of the league. And I was put off the same day, you know. But that didn't matter, they were going to bear us one way or another, I'd say. And as I said, Michael Murphy, or Sean Murphy, you did, had a great game there in the middle of the field. And he wasn't at the races in the final, the chunk was more to them, you know. That's Pat Lally, and this is Chunky O'Brien, all alone. And a lovely shot from inside the 40 yards, and it's a Kilkenny point by Chunky O'Brien, his second point of the game. A free for Galway from their own 50-yard line, Sean Silk Decatur. And what a belt on that ball. P.J. Quarter gets it into his hand. Across to Frank Burke in front of the goal. Frank gets shot. A goal! A goal! There it is. There's the man. And let's see how he did it. Here's the ball. A crack. A shot. And into the back of the net. Chunky not going too far with him soloing today. It doesn't pay too much. And a high ball got up there by Michael Brennan and sent over the bar for a point for Kilkenny. Michael Brennan, who was moved out to right half forward. What a lovely feeling there by Brian Cody. What a wonderful young herder he is. And here comes Michael Crotty now. And this is Eddie Kerr. And that's the goal.
body, but nobody could have saved it. It's now 1-10 to 1-3 in favor of Kilkenny. Can Galway come back now? Michael Crotty takes another shot, and it's over the bar for another point. And all this with less than four minutes gone in the second half. T.J. Qualter pulls on it, but no, out it comes now to John Connolly. John shot a hopping dangerous ball, Qualter takes a shot, and it's a goal! It's a goal! It's a goal, P.J. Qualter! P.J. Qualter was the one who finished it. Here it comes in from John Connolly. Goes up in the air. P.J. Qualter goes up for it, taps it down, and it's in the net. And that keeps this game so much alive. The dropping ball and the waiting man. Liam O'Brien shot is high and it's over the bar to increase the Kilkenny lead once again. That's Bearden Purcell. And this is Pat Delaney with the ball. He takes a shot and the goalkeeper's got it out. He's got it out. And here's it out to free. It doesn't matter what happens. Here it comes. This time it's gone. It's a goal. Michael Connolly and oh, that's the way the cookie crumbles. When things aren't going right for you, things go right for somebody else. And the man who took advantage there was Frank Cummins. What wonderful opportunism. And Mick Lanigan and Johnny McGovern and the Kilkenny mentors delighted with what they see and what they hear. We had been there for four or five years in all Ireland finals, and I'd say the press probably camped over in Galway with all these new players, and, and with an inexperienced team that probably put a lot of pressure on Galway for that final. Losing in '75 uh, wasn't all that bad. I mean, we, we lost to a great, great Kilkenny team. I mean, the six forwards that Kilkenny had that time, I think, would never be, would never see six forwards as good as they, as, as, as uh, again ever. Um, each of them, like you know, could 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 burst through for goals or take scores from any angles. They were just great, great forwards. Later in the year, James Stevens won the Kilkenny County Championship, and the following March, Van Larkin captained the village to win the first club championship for the county. We were very lucky to beat Buffers Alley below in below in, par, in Wexford Park in the first round. George's brother Mickey Lahey scored a goal that day. Only for that we were bit, you know. And Cody had a great game playing centre back on Dordan, you know. We had an exceptional team, but they had a, a star studded team as well, you know. I think that's seven or eight at Cork team plus Frank Cummins. Ray Cummins and all the lads. They were a great team and they had won a couple of All Ireland Club Championships, so we were that was our first taste of it. But it was a wicked wet day, windy wet day. And I'd say the wind of the toss had a big deal in it. We won the toss and I was captain and I elected to play again in the wind. The first minute they had to go up ball in the back of the net. We were 2-2 two, two to no score down after about 10 minutes. We hadn't registered the score and it looked awful bad. And then we held them to two points from there to the end and we scored 2-10 after that ourselves. Mylan stuck the ball in the net off a 21, went up off my hand, caught it. It went up off my hand and hit the top of that crossbar and came down up behind it. And after that then we got on top of them. When I was playing it was a smaller, a smaller area that we were involved with because um, it was just on the edge of the town really and very much, it wasn't a built up area or anything like that but now over the last number of years it's very much a built up area and it's become a very, very, very big parish. But the great thing is that we have retained a great spirit and you know we've always been known as the village. Despite losing the league final to Clare, Kilkenny beat Wexford in the Leinster final of 78. A place in the final against Cork was at stake in the all Ireland semi-final against Galway. Lovely cut, Not, it's a goal, a goal, the ball if anything was deflected, this is Matt Roots getting inside Niall McInerney, still Matt Roots, still Niall McInerney after him, oh my elbow, and a nice calm ball into the net, nice feeling there by Joe Greeny, the youngest player in the Galway team, and what a fine game he's playing, the dropping ball into the hand of Ger Henderson, Ger Henderson out to the wing now to Joe Hennessy. Joe Hennessy way upfield with the ball now, being chased by Joe Connolly. 
Billy Joel Hennessy. Billy Joel Hennessy. And a point for Joe Hennessy. A fine point there taken by Joe Hennessy. Here come Galway into the attack. Frank Brennan with the Frank Burke with the ball now. Right in front of the goal. A shot. A goal. A goal. Another goal. He may have missed some sitters early on, but what a goal that was. Noel Ski in with the puck out again. And all alone is Matt Ruth. And here goes Matt. And there goes the goal. Matt Ruth, two goal Matt. That's who he is. The final against Cork was an even contest until a Jimmy Barry Murphy shot was deflected into the net. Oh, lovely recovery there by Matt with a nice ball. Dennis Paul and Fielding at the goal now. The ball is in the net. It's the goal. Here it is again. Here it goes in. In fact, it was uh, Kevin Fennelly who finished it. Pat Henderson got in, pulled back, and going off is Chucky O'Brien. In fact, Pat Henderson not pulled back, but center half back. Long ball, in towards the goal. Hands going out to him. Jimmy Barry Murphy with a shot that's low. And it's the goal! Jimmy Barry Murphy, the scorer of the goal that can win in Ireland. Well, up there, he's been batted. Now he's trying to follow his way in towards Billy Goodpatrick. It's the goal! It's the goal! Billy Goodpatrick, the scorer. There he is. I told you this game wasn't over yet. The ball passed across the finish with Patrick, and there's the low shot that crashed into the net. And this one we probably left behind is against Cork. Cork were, I think, a tired enough team in 78, having won two in a row, and they won three in a row that year. And as I say, no disrespect to them, they were a great team, they beat Wexford two in a row, but we should have been able to take them that year. And uh, uh, went, it just went wrong on us in the midway through the second half. So that was played full forward in the championship for Kilkenny in 78. We got to the final and, and we lost out to Cork very, very narrowly. But it wouldn't have been my natural position, certainly. But at the time, or at any time, you don't pick and choose where you play. You, you get a jersey, you get a Kilkenny jersey, or a village jersey, whatever jersey you get, and you're just dying to get it. Lack of experience, I reckon. Uh, we're probably the starting of a new team, and probably the finishing of a few of the older guys from the previous great run of team. And uh, of course, Cork were going for three in a row, they had experience. But uh, it wasn't there weren't that much in it in the end, really. You know, in Cork or in Kilkenny, the feat of three in a row wouldn't have been as readily acknowledged if we hadn't included Kilkenny in our list of defeats in the three in a row. And I think when we did that, it finally was the icing on the cake for that team. 1979 was the 10th Kilkenny-Wexford-Leinster final meeting of the decade. In a great game, Kilkenny won and were on their way to a repeat of the 1975 final against Galway. Here's Matt Rood breaking away from Mick Butler. Still Matt Rood charging through the Butler and then from an angle smashed it in past Henry Butler. That's Ger Fennelly to Billy Fitzpatrick. The champions moving well again. Mick Brennan claiming he was pushed off that. Mick Trotty coming way out to the sideline. And a shot from Mick from way over near the sideline. A very difficult angle. Magnificent point by the full forward. To Hennessy, beautifully taken. This is Frank Commons and a shot. This is Billy Fitzpatrick. It's the goal. Frank Commons with this shot. It was parried and then it came to Billy Fitzpatrick here and he blasted it along the ground to the net. Colm Dorn bouncing away from him. Mick Jacob, his brother in law, eventually getting it away. Beautiful feeling by Ger Henderson and then the long line shot. Magnificent point. This is Mick Jacob for Wexford. There's coolness and confidence by the centre half back. He's passed then going to Joe Hennessy. The shot from Joe is a beautiful point. That was well, well done by the midfielder. And then 79 was the uh, first final I actually played in. 
again against Galway and uh, I suppose one of the games you'll always remember I suppose because it was your first all Ireland to play in and uh, a great occasion. Well we had people like Eddie Kerr and Pat Henderson involved in people like that I suppose they came with a lot of experience themselves. Henderson there a moment ago and this team there is uh, Frank Cummins and uh, Mick Trotty pulling him across there and the man on the right, the littlest man on the field, the oldest man on the field, the lightest man on the field, that's Van Larkin. Now uh, Chunky O'Brien has had a green towel delivered to him from the sideline, uh, that to uh, dry his hands before he takes the 65. A point here could put Kilkenny into the lead. But no, it's not high enough, it's gone in towards the goal, Seamus, it was a miserable wet day in the early stages, I can remember. Uh, we probably got a few lucky breaks with a, with a couple of goals to, to win the game for us. But it was a, I suppose it was a team that uh, there wasn't a huge amount expected of. And uh, I suppose those type of all Ireland are often the, uh, the best ones to win. Kind of one we, we could have lost, you know, one we wouldn't have been writing up before anyway. Like, you know, so Galway had their chances you know, on, on the day, I thought myself. There used to be a little... The still in Crow Park there is a shop as you go in under the Hogan sta under the Cusy stand. It's an off license. Now it says I didn't bring it, it says Paddy Morton brought me brought me to it. That when the match would be over, all those five or six of us that it just to take a drink after the matches, you know, Chunky, myself, Cloney, Delaney, and Morton and a few of the Breeze lads. Paul Skane is slicker. We'd all I'd be dressed gone before half and being off the field and he was and we'd be gone to that place. There's no doubt about it that, that uh, 79 was, uh, was really shattered us. Um, uh, we, we, we went up with great expectations and, and, and I remember coming down the train uh, after the game and, and even knowing my wife said that uh, we're never going to win it. And I, I almost started believing in the, in, in the curse that was supposed to be on Galway Hurling that we'd never win All Ireland uh, and, and we left at it for so long. At the time people felt that, but subsequently they would have been proved wrong in the sense that the young fellows who came in proved their work in 82 and 83 and proved to be great players. Kilkenny man Dermot Healy came to Offaly and helped to mastermind the downfall of his native county in 1980. Players who jumped up for it, Joe Wall, the man who spotted the break and gets the shot and then gets the point. Matt Root here for the champions. Matt Root with the shot and it's in the back of the net. Oh, Matt Root took that so well. The Offaly backs were converging on him on the right of the large parallel ground. He turned around and with not very much space to swing his hurley, he got it into the far corner of the net. Brian Cody for Kilkenny. Miss hitting it. Corey Corden on it now. The shot from Corey. He's listening to them. Only 9,000 supporters were there in total, which is a very, slow, very low attendance for Leinster final. And literally that day, Kilkenny were definitely caught on the hop, you know. I suppose in, in, in hindsight, it was a bit fantastic for hurling, as uh, more recent years of Clare and, and Wexford uh, have been. But it was a great breakthrough, brought about by my own very good friend from my own club, Dermot Healy, who played a significant part. Um, in going to Offaly, I suppose, he, he always felt there was a fair amount of talent there. Probably felt it wasn't being harnessed properly. Maybe there was too much emphasis on the physical side. But he put a huge amount of emphasis on coaching and on stick work and improving the skill of the players, and uh, it certainly paid dividends. In 1981, Ballyhale Shamrocks gave the lead to small rural clubs by beating St Finbars of Cork in the all Ireland club final. Uh, up to then, I'd been dominated probably by, uh, really by the like of the Cork teams. We were the first team, the first rural team to win the club championship in 1981. We beat the Bars in the final, which was a great occasion for the parish. The final was dead in Torles, and uh, I recall it was a fabulous game against Finn Bars, who had 15 of the county hurlers playing that day. We had a, I think, to the Roadstone lorry lined up to bring us up the streets, and, uh, and uh, there were great crowds in the, in the street, and uh, it was an occasion to remember. We had no playing field of our own, and it was the Carmelites that. Uh, Gave us a field in Oktober to train on. Now, 
we trained on it, which is a good pitch for that, but to, to not feel that there were any real games played in because it wasn't up to the standard really. And uh, we had no dressing rooms. We used to really take out under the, the landies over in the corner and uh, have the chat. For that fact alone, I suppose, was <laughs> unique to win without any of the, the big clubhouses and the, the showers that people have to have nowadays. And the, 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 the facilities have to be number one nowadays. But in our day, Hurland was number one and uh, that's all that matters to us really. In 1982, Kilkenny turned the tide against all Ireland champions Offaly. Cork, by virtue of their displays in Munster, were hot favourites for the final. Ironically, um, it all started maybe down in Kerry, funnily enough, uh, where we were beaten by, or we drew at Kerry in a National League game and just took great headlines, and maybe things started to galvanise from that. Offaly had won the All-Ireland the year before, and uh, we were a few of us over with them in, in, in the States, and they were pretty prepared over there, they trained hard over there and a week after they coming back they defeated us in the Leinster final and uh, I must say it was one of the greatest games I ever played in. In the latter end we just happened to come out by two or three points in the end in, a, in an, an epic game and uh, we felt when we won that one that we had a great chance to win the All-Ireland even though uh, Cork would have been absolute firm favourites. And really we were written off, which I suppose was a grand way to be going to an All-Ireland final and uh, we were savagely determined, not just as, re as a result of that certainly, but as a result of the fact that we had a decent team and we were being trained at the time by Pat Henderson, we had a great spirit, we had a fine, strong, physically strong team, good team and, and we were certainly determined in a major way to try and win it. We had, we had already won the league that year. This is a better one, good cut. Richie Power going for it. Towards the lead penalty, lead penalty scoops it in and he scoops it over and there's the lead for Kilkenny. Paddy Prendergast, who certainly has been lording it over Tony O'Sullivan up to now. This is Richie Power. Richie Power's shot is high. Richie Power's shot is good. Oh, these Kilkenny men, how they've improved this year. John Blake. Frank Cobham. I was going to say all alone, but not for long. A goal! A goal! Frank Cobham stepped in, and it was uh, deflected. And Heffernan, Heffernan, I think, got his hand to it. It was certainly deflected by somebody. In it goes from Frank Cobham right into the goal box. It's dropping down and deflected by Christy Heffernan. Frank Cobham's got possession and hit it in, and I was. I was inside Martin, Martin O'Doherty and Gerald Cunningham just moved off his line but I went to catch the ball and it deflected off my hand into the net, into the net. so there was nobody, Gerald was after moving out for the break behind us. But uh, it was only pucked out straight away and to straight back in so I'd say a minute was there. <laughs> the, the replay on the television I didn't, didn't actually get the second part at all because I was showing the replay the first one. Uh, it happened so quick. I can barely remember the ball come in, I was out and gone and in, and the flag was off again. <laughs> Here it is again, from a different angle. And the ball going in towards the goal from Frank Cummins. Frank Cummins, and it was deflected by Christy Heffernan. And now we're back alive, and it's Christy Heffernan again. He's going through, he's getting ready to take a shot. And it is a goal, a goal by Christy Heffernan. And Kilkenny have run them up. Well, the game is on, the second half is on, and Kilkenny out in front, 2-11 to 7 points. Can they stay there? Richie Power into the centre to Ger Fennelly. Still Ger Fennelly. And that point it puts them to 12 to 7 points as Ger waltzing his way past three or four Cork men as if they were nothing at all, stretching the lead to 2 12 to 7 points. And if so that was short passing there, Lee Fennelly. A dangerous ball. Ger Fennelly. A goal! A goal by Ger Fennelly! The icing in the Kilkenny cake as Jeff Fennelly took that one and there isn't a man alive who would have uh, who would have saved it. Here it comes down. Comes out now on the loose and here is Jeff Fennelly going through. I mean, going into an Ireland final you're always better off to be the underdogs and, and you always hope that you'll be the underdogs. Um, I think, you know, our performance in, in, in the Munster final was, was, was 
exceptional. Um, it, it was it was not um, typical of our performances throughout the year, um, and, and suited Kilkenny down to the ground. Um, and we we probably um, thought we were better than we were, uh, and and it probably the final of '82 was probably one of the most disappointing. Uh, performances by a Cork team that I had been involved in. We got caught obviously, we got we fell for a big sucker punch and got absolutely destroyed in the All-Ireland final, you know, and there were no excuses really. I remember distinctly, you know, I was playing in Brian Cody, a young a young Brian Cody at the time, and I, an old Ray Cummins, and um, at one stage I, I remember chasing him from his own 21-yard line right down the full field onto the Cork 21 yard line um, and I try I like it like you know a dog after a pup if you like and, and, and um, I'm sure I was half as on the field and, and when it struck me that it's time to get out you know <laughs> I retired after that match you know. Kilkenny won the double again in 1983 they played with a very strong breeze in the first half of the All-Ireland final but were only six points up at half time this is Billy Fitzpatrick Billy is shot across and it's over the bar for another point. Billy, who really is unsung today. Oh, well, that's one way of getting a good view. And Billy Fitzpatrick again. John Crowley trying to get at him, but Billy's shot is good. It's over the bar. Another point, his fifth of the game, and that is still Kenny's seventh. John Crowley to take the line ball. He cuts it, the breeze catches it. Ball goes now to Harry Ryan across into the centre now and Frank Cummins with the ball going through a shot. No, the shot is knocked down. He tries to get, and it is a goal! I got a goal about a minute before half time and Richie Power got a goal a minute after half time. We had a, an extra six points on the board in a matter of minutes, so right at each side of half time, which made a, made a difference probably on the day. We came out the second half and I wasn't sitting down in my seat and they scored the third goal, put them 10 points clear. That was hard to draw back, so we just couldn't, we failed by two points. And there's the throw in, the second half is on, and Kilkenny in the attack. Billy Fitzpatrick, Christy Hefferton. Ball breaks now, and it goes to Ger Fennelly, into Harry Ryan. Ryan trying to get through. And a shot, and a goal! A goal by Richie Powell! And that's the kind of goal that wins all Ireland championships. A hand pass in from Ger Fennelly to Harry Ryan. Harry Ryan tips it on his stick, then hand passes it in. And it's tipped in there by Richie Powell and Kilkenny lead 2-10, two, two seven points. They have about five minutes in which to save the game. And Kenny of five minutes in which to hold on. Pat Horgan into the goal mouth. It is say it's a goal! It's a goal! It's a goal! And I think Sean O'Leary could be the one that got it. It was another one of the uh, deflected shots. Here is the shot, the 65 by Pat Horgan. It comes into the goal mouth. There's a tussle into the goal. Kevin Hennessy is in there, and Sean O'Leary is the one who finished it. Cole scheme with the pick out, and they puck out into the centre of the field. John Buckley with the ball now. And a hand pass across to the far side, but the referee penalises him for losing his hurley. Did he drop or was he robbed? The same question there as there was some time ago with Frank Cummins on the far side of the field. About two minutes left of the game, two points between them. Ger Henderson who will not break any track records in taking it. <laughs> Lobbing ball. Comes out, Tim Crowley throws his everything at it. Tom Cashman now is on the ground, and there's a free for Cork. Cork, wind assisted, and about 50 metres out from the Kilkenny goal, and Pat Horgan takes it. Meanwhile, Tom Cashman is down injured, but the play goes on as Cork try to win it with 14 men, or not to win it so much as to draw level as they're trying to do at this stage. 
ball is out on the far side of the field. Referee has called for the ball. Between the 82 team and the 83 team, I was the only one uh, not on the team in 83. I had um, I got my hand broken uh, in a, an incident in um, the All-Star trip to America in early part of 83. And by the time I got back um, and everything was right, I suppose the team had settled a little bit. And so Liam Fennelly joins his brother Joe as a captain of the Kilkenny winning All-Ireland team. That particular day was very, very windy. Billy Fitzpatrick had a tremendous day that day. He scored points from all angles. And he even said himself that the young player put one's, waved the flag for one's how wide. There was two people that had a great view that the young player and myself with that ball, and we both agreed it was a very good score now. In 1984, St. Martin surprised the faithless Belly Hale Shamrocks in the county final. St. Patrick's Day, 85, then against Castlegar. And. Crow Park was always going to be a very big ordeal for our players because none of them had played in Crow Park at senior level. Tom Warren got a goal from free, which had brought, brought it back into the game and it ended as a draw on to Thurlis then a week later. We got a few very crucial frees during the hailstorm, about 65, 70 yards out towards the wing on the newsstand side and Johnny Brennan scored them. And we didn't look back from there to the end, although we only won by the two points. The older generation at that time could never have imagined anything like that. Even winning a senior county championship in Kenya, they could never have. Fully came out of Leinster in 84 and 85 and beat Galway in the 1985 All Ireland final. Kilkenny beat the All Ireland champions in the 86 Leinster final and played Galway in the semi final. We had already played a league final in 86 against Kilkenny in Torres and we found that they were a very, very strong midfield, strong physical team. And we sat down the following Monday week after the league final and we tried to analyse how we were going to beat them because we figured they would come out of Leinster. They were the strongest team around. And midfield we felt was a problem. We had one anchor man as such, Steve Mahan, at the time and we were looking for another. And we tried every combination in training throughout the, you know, out the club championship but nothing was happening. So we're just saying maybe if we just change the policy altogether, play three midfields. Now at that stage it would be very, very new and play two on the full forward line. But we had one or two forwards coming through at that stage that, that people didn't know about. Joe Cooney was really blossoming as such. Martin Nocton was coming with pace. Steve Mahan has been very influential in midfield. That ball not forward by Pierce Spigot to Joe Cooney. To the on-running Anthony Cunningham. Must be a goal. It's there. It's Galway's second goal, and Anthony Cunningham has got it. was it. simple in the sense that if we got the ball outside, if the Kilkenny cornerback came out, we hit it into space. If he didn't come out, we had to carry it and use an overlap that we had outside, or hit it into a man that was marked. Now, while it was easy work in training, we just felt maybe in the match itself it might not work, but as it happened, like, you know, it worked beyond the dream. We were probably caught on the hop that day. Galway had so many goals that day, we didn't know where we were. Uh, by half time, didn't, they were, were leaking, <laughs> the ship was leaking everywhere. <laughs> and the harder we tried, the worse it got. And I was after being brought on with about 10 minutes to go, I suppose, and the game was well lost at the time, I suppose, wanted to keep me happy, you know, you know the way itself. Uh, and this woman was going up in front of Bernie anyway. I said, geez, she says, I, I, I knew we were better than seeing Fitzpatrick coming out with, it with 10 minutes to go. I said, I knew, I knew the game was up then, she said, you know. I think she, uh, Bernie had a few words with her, I think. Kilkenny and Galway met in the 87 All Ireland final. It's a very good substitutes bench with PJ Malloy in there too, Tony Kilkenny and one or two others. Ollie Kilkenny, Christy Herpenen stopping, but it's Jerry McInerney following up. Down towards Martin Nocton, trying to let it run on, comes to Brendan Linsky, on the 40, inside, has the sell to Anthony Cunningham. Trying to break open the stick any defence, and at last we seem to be having a bit of real play. And going into the final against Kilkenny, it was the same old story. Well, the pressure was on. Third time in, if we're going to lose this time, you know, we'd be kind of shot forever as such. There's no doubt about it, there was pressure. The morning of the game, it was pouring rain. We'd always go to the Phoenix Park for a puck round, and this was the dilemma of Galway Hall, we couldn't handle the rain. And I kept reminding the lads, look, at, we had played Cork in the rain. In the semi final, we had beat them, so why not Kilkenny? It's good running by Harry Ryan. If he can get inside, Sylvia Lenane, the chip shot. Oh, it's a lovely boy. Harry Ryan's first point means the sides are level again. Sean Fennelly will have
have something to say about that as the match is just a minute and a half left. Tony Kidd from outside his own 65 meter line, and that now is certainly a point which Kepa Fossen's Galway's possession. In 1991, Glenmore became the fourth Kilkenny club to win the club All Ireland. George Lahey was training this afternoon. George was a great trainer. So a great, great trainer. Other people have different ideas, but I thought he was a great man to keep, keep the keep players feet on the, firmly on the ground and concentrate on the game. He always said to us, the one thing I'll never, never forget him always saying, what happened yesterday is history. The final then we played Patrick's well. There was only one goal and just after half time a ball came in and uh, I scored a goal after it. But they had, they had a few chances now, good chances of Heinz to hit wide. All men were crying that day. That was the day, I'd say, the biggest day for the small parish. There's only one pub and a shop in it, in church, that's it. There's no, there's a um, school, up, school up the road and I said the total population of the parish is, is uh, probably less than, a, less than a thousand people. I came back to Glenmore in 87 and I took up a, 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 a job working in Waterford uh, selling insurance for New Ireland Insurance Company. And both myself and Ray uh, started our own company then later that year about Heffernan insurance, and we're going still. <laughs> in 91, um, Wexford should have beaten Kilkenny. That's, you know, that was, the, the 90s wasn't, it was quite good in the early 90s. Uh, DJ ran 477 steps with the ball and got a kick the ball into the back of the net and, and got a goal. And a lot of Wexford fellows were questioning the referee in the day, and quite rightly so, because he did. And in fact, I will f say as well, he pushed Liam down in the back to win the ball. But more luck to him, that's part of the game. After three years of awfully dominance in Leinster, Kilkenny were back on the All-Ireland Trail once more in 1991. As well. I think it will because John Power has moved from the centre forward position now towards the wing and he got two. One particular pass for the second point has got a beautiful point. DJ Carey picking up the break, up towards Christy Heffernan. Possibly falling uh, Colin McGillon in the process, giving an insight to Adrian Robin. Yes! Half block down, comes back out to Dean McCarthy. That pressure that Eamon Cregan was talking about, that nervousness, very evident in the Dublin defence. They've paid the penalty for it, because that's John Parr's third point. Richie Parr. To DJ Carey. A ah, beautiful start. Then Michael Field and then the two O'Connors and yeah, Pasha O'Neill was on stream and DJ and Adrian Rowan and, and Liam Walsh. You could go down through the whole whole list of it and, and, and Liam Finley and, and Richie and Christy and John Henderson, they stayed along to, to guide us along, you know. The 89 All Ireland finalists Antrim were the opposition in the semi final. This is pulled forward in McCarry. Putting across two corner forward Jim Close. And Kilkenny. Get the first ball out. Up towards big Christy Heffernan, Eamon Morrissey, Lee McCarthy inside. And certainly Eamon Morrissey has a goal scoring opportunity here. He has to, he does. After 26 seconds of play, Eamon Morrissey to score for Kilkenny. Liam Kennelly trying to get inside Dominic McKinley. Getting it out to Christy Heffernan. And a good save by Kelly Horrigan. Breaks inside. by DJ Carey, he's placing it very carefully, and an indication that he's going to try and put it over. It's going to be some score if he scores it. Oh. Not his best by any means, but it comes to big Christy Heffernan, to Eamon Morrissey. They can't allow him swing now. He has a go, and it's gone over. Eamon Morrissey. It was then a case of all rivals Tipperary in the All-Ireland final. The game wasn't a classic, and the miss hit 21 yards free by Michael Cleary was the turning point. Liam Fennelly, Fennelly causing problems, and he's put it over the bar. There's just a point in it. A lot of the players were very young, and we were concerned that going in against Tipperary, who were a more experienced team than us, uh, they had won an All Ireland uh, just a couple of years previous to that. We felt that they had a bit more experience than us, and we were afraid that the day might pass our younger players by. 
I, I got a goal against Wexford, kicked the goal, we struggled through it. Dublin should have beaten us in the Leinster final. The game against Antrim, we got two points in the last, with the last two pucks of the game, really, to beat them. So we were struggling. To the delight of the Kilkenny fans, the long clearance. Colin Bond runner pressure from DJ Carey. Carey rating inside, and it's favoured left hand side, and it's over the bar for another point. Three points in the match now for DJ Carey. That's the first from play, and Kilkenny now lead by two. Bill Hennessy under it against Nicky English. He's done really well against English and kept him scoreless. Indeed, as we've said already, the entire temporary full forward line yet to score. Morrissey against Michael Ryan. Having difficulty picking it up, taking the shoulder from Bobby Ryan with great confidence. Oh, that's a super point by Evan Morrissey. He beat his man. He took the shoulder that came in from Bobby Ryan perfectly fairly, stood his ground, and with unerring accuracy, sent it over the bar to put three points between the teams. John Henderson back on his goal line. The Henderson brothers hold 11 All-Ireland medals between them at senior level. Pat with five, John and Ger with three each. And now John having the chance to get a fourth this afternoon. Meanwhile, the other John, John Lahey. Nicky English with a fine catch against Bill Hennessy, who was holding him out, and Nicky English engineers the free. So a chance for Michael Cleary to extend Tipperary's lead once again to a two-point lead. He's got a goal! A goal! A speculative shot by Michael Cleary. The opening goal of the match comes after ten minutes. We were saying there's never been a Tip Kilkenny final without a goal. Well, that was right out of the blue. In towards Christy Hepperton. Breaks down, picked up by Fennelly, they need a goal badly, stopped, runs loose, and in the end it's uh, Colin Bonner, right on his own blend line, so near and yet so far for Kilkenny. It's all over and Tipperary have won the All-Ireland. A few decisions went against us, refereeing decisions went against us. Um, even the goal that Tipperary got, Michael Cleary took a free and... Everybody in Tipperary tell you the same, that it wasn't even a free. We huffed and puffed through the championship that year. We beat uh, Dublin in the Leinster final and we didn't play well as such. And Antrim could have taken us in the semi-final. And we were really lambs for the slaughter for the All-Ireland. Uh, Tip had a settled team and they were after having big battles with Galway the previous couple of years. And they had Pat Fox and Nicky English and the whole lot. Like, and Ollie tried to instill into us all that we were good enough to go ahead and win the game. But we were young and I suppose inexperienced and, and the whole lot like and um, it was a day that we kind of really out hurled Tipperary big time that day and didn't put scores on the board. The Rosa Kamini said I have a, a jersey for you, he said in here and I want you to wear it and he said it's not five or seven and I said I hope it's not 27 but he said no, he said it's number 11. I was 10 years of age and I sat on my father's knee in Lally stand and outside me on that day, right corner back, was Fan Larkin, and in goal was Ali Walsh. First time I went to a dentist, it was the clinic, and it was Ali Welsh was driving the ambulance. I'm sure, I mean, having a tooth taken out, I'd have gone the following day to have another one taken out. I never heard him criticise a person. He never called it back in and said, you so and so, why didn't you do this or that? It wasn't his nature. He just took it and went on with it. It's just ironic that at 10 years of age, that down the road, and I couldn't obviously see it at that stage, that I was to be involved so closely with both of those players, Fan as a player and Ollie as a manager. He was a family man first and foremost. He looked after his father and his mother in their later years before their deaths and so on. But all of his lovely wife and, and his children were paramount in his life. I came in one wet night and I think I was late there and uh, uh, he said, you're the only man with sense. He said, win there and sit down. He was highly intelligent in his placing of the ball. He had a tremendous sidestep. And people still talk in Kilkenny of going behind the kids going behind the goal to watch this man. Chasing after Brendan Kill. Good harassment by Galway. Comes back to Adrian Ronan. Dropping it dangerously in and well gathered by Tom Hillibert. Well dispossessed. DJ Carey. Difficult angle. And Richard Burke satisfied to just tap it over the bar really he could do nothing else with it Eddie O'Connor, Willie O'Connor moving out to Justin Campbell and Justin Campbell gathers it nicely cutting through, goal opportunity oh what a goal Campbell from Kiltormer and we can confirm that Pat Malone is concussed at the moment but is not being taken to hospital so we're glad to hear that much at least 
and we wish him a speedy recovery and being very well looked after as Jamesy Brennan comes in and the shiner begins to sparkle he's hardly in 30 seconds or so he gets a point John Power showing that they've handballers down that part of the country as well again DJ Carey giving it inside in Finley coming across Richard Burke has come out to clear when he gets to the short distance and Liam McCarthy puts it in Liam McCarthy from Piltdown and the Kilkenny women and having performed pretty good against Tipperary and all Ireland we felt there was there was definitely one all Ireland at least in this squad so we um, we regrouped after the all Ireland final we went away for a short break ironically we simply went as far as Clare for a long weekend and I believe that the, the, the success was sown in Clare for the following two years. Kilkenny were back to face Cork, whom they had beaten in 82 and 83. The wet and windy conditions spoiled the game, but didn't hamper DJ Carey, and Kilkenny won their 24th title. Always influential. Tapping the Trolleys are out here, Frank Murphy bringing the... Cork umbrella for the Michael O'Brien there with a kind of uh, Alaska type jacket, jacket on his shoulders. As the inside track changes, he's going to put the set back. Back to thunder his way through. Just to see what can, can he do to her? Will they go for a goal play against the breeze? They're only three points down, and they uh, wonder what they're going to do at this stage. I think Jeremy's a bit concerned about the ball being perhaps too dry. I think he was much on the ball when he tried to drive the ball to the pressure ball. <laughs> Happened once or twice before, too. I think it did. All right. Well, this is the Munster final of uh, several years ago. This is DJ Kelly in a significant stage of the match coming up to hit the penalty. Playing with wind is one thing. Playing with wind and rain is really difficult for free taking, for striking the ball. Basically, both had gone for the second half. You know, now you'd say going out, well, we have no wind, so we have no wind advantage. But we went, only went in at half time, two points down. Gr great, great advantage uh, coming out for the second half. If you get a score, it's, I can't explain it. You ask any other players, same. You come out from the goal after getting a score. The crowd, the noise of the crowd, there's a, a humming in your ears. It, it's uh, and probably adrenaline or call it what you like, but there's a, the crowd just goes like that. It's like, it's like turning the volume of the radio up and down in your ear like that, coming out after getting a, a score with the crowd roaring. So I came in on the pitch that day and I gave the thing to the referee, but it was almost as if I, that sound was there. Every step, like that, turn the radio up and down. Meanwhile, Shawnee McCarthy batting it down at the centre of the field. Well fed back by Michael Fielder to Pat O'Neill, a day for rolling up the sleeves and doing the simple things well by both teams in towards Big Christie, we marked in there by Dennis Mulcahy, John Parr foraging, John Parr breaking through, and John Parr scoring! Just about three and a half minutes of the second half. You know, Frank Cummins had that as well. When I came on first, like Frank gave me a great confidence. And he said, look, he said to me, Christy by it's like love to one of that. Same thing, he said. It's a great green field. <laughs> you can do it up there, you can do it up here, he said. <laughs> so Shawnee McCarthy has taken over the free taking duties from Brian Corcoran. Again hitting on his left hand side and again finding the range quite superbly. That's three points now for Shawnee McCarthy. Eight points is tally in this year's championship, and as you see, there's just a point between the teams. Three from three, his figures in the game. Three attempts uh, to getting a score. Kilkenny's DJ Carey, shouldered by Jim Cashman. Again, DJ, fleet-footed and sticking it over the bar. Expertly taken score, rallying his side now. And a real competitive All-Ireland hurling final. With Eamon Morris, who tried to make some room for himself. Hesitation there by Pat Buckley and by Dennis Welsh. And the profit there gained by Liam McCarthy. They've shown their full hand at this stage, having introduced their three second half subs. But it's Pat O'Neill who continues to defy them time and again. Towards Phelan. They have the look of a winning team. And Michael Phelan has dropped it over the bar. It's a very 
proud moment for Liam Fennelly. The McCarthy Cup goes back to Northside. It'll be back at the Marvel City tomorrow night. Till Kenny, the champions of 19... Dear captain of the Kenny 21 team, uh, 74, Kevin captained it. Uh, they won it both times. 76, Sean captained the winning minor team. Uh, the only minor we won actually so you know we were lucky that day and uh, I think mean, the system is the winning club nominates the winning captain then I was then your captain the senior team in 78 or 79 to win dollar and I was captain in 83 and Frank Hooden was captain of the winning league team I think it was around that period as well and uh, I was captain of the league team in, in 83 as well and Sean captained the league team I think in, in 1990 and I captained the, the Kenny senior team winning the McCarthy Cup in 92. So we were, we've had a good run as captains of the team. So and long may it continue with, with maybe Henry Sheffield someday. And 93 was a magnificent game, one of the finest games the hurling ever seen in Crow Park. This is Liam Simpson calmly taking it around Story, making the clearance, still no score. Tom Dempsey played well at midfield last Sunday. Dropped in towards Scallon, Story, here's Scallon! So brilliantly! And Michael Walsh has made a great save! It's gone for a 65, but just as in the drawn match, Michael Welsh comes to Kilkenny's rescue, but a tremendous early save. Well, again, a bit of uncertainty in the Kilkenny full back line here, and the ball breaks loose here. Martin Storley doesn't take that well. The ball breaks loose, Damon Scallon. In the first time shot, landed on, but again, brilliant save by Michael Walsh. Worth an outstanding all season for Kilkenny. Knocks over for a 65. Whelan battling in there with Sean Whelan. Not Cohen coming forward, the wing back. The replacement wing back for Liam Welsh on towards John Power. Hand pass forward towards the full forward PJ Delaney. Delaney in a scoring position. It's a goal! Well, great player by Liam Crowe, he really made the score. Great attacking play on the half back line. Hand pass to John Power, who was so influential again last Sunday. We're always looking for his teammate who's available. Spot PJ Delaney inside. Under pressure here, gets outside his man and a great left handed shot in the conditions right along the ground. Great score for Kilkenny. Up towards Eamon Morris, he hasn't made the switch yet into full forward. Doesn't need to, he's lost his boot. Dropping it across, it's in! DJ Carey! Morris, he provided the fodder, lost the boot, but nice created ball. the opening. Great ball again from John Poy, no keep on him, but gives great ball inside for the fouls. Eamon Morris, he actually loses his boot here, but a good, dangerous ball into the defence. DJ Carey never takes his eye off it, that's a tremendous goal. Great corner forwards goal. Kilkenny put another two All-Ireland titles back-to-back -back in 92 and 93 at the expense of the tribesmen. Hennessy, players calling for it all around him. Bill on his way through. John Carr supporting. Out towards Morrissey. One's out of sense to McCarthy. Tyrone wins the over the bar. So Ricky Burke tucking out. The wind at his back, remember. Getting plenty of length into it right down in there between half-backs and uh, full-backs. And again, it's Pat O'Neill. Huge delivery inside. And it runs on there. It's PJ Delaney. Two Galway players went for the one ball. And it's a great save by Richie Burke. And Ronan finishes it to the back of the net. A goal by Adrian Ronan. Only nine minutes gone. He makes the habit of getting good scores. Well, good play by PJ Delaney here. But he'd be very relieved that Adrian Ronan was following in here because Goldkick makes a good save here, but just knocks it out to Adrian Owen, who's following in, and a great corner forwards goal there, following in the play. Running back there is Paul Cooney, it breaks out to Raymond Morrissey. Murti Kalele putting in the challenge, wrestled uh, Morrissey, allowed an advantage, and Kilkenny got another point. They stretch the lead to three points once again. Morrissey's second score. For the first 15 minutes, we went through Galway, you know, handy enough, like as such, and uh, and and we opened up a, a lead, and and we found ourselves, I suppose, relaxing a bit, and uh, they came back into the game and really put the game up to us. Liam Welch coming into the centre. Liam McCarthy, I should say, McCarthy outside here to Adrian Ronan. Ronan on his way once again, stopped there by Paul Cooney. Bill Hennessy picking it up on his left hand side, looking for the score, and Bill Hennessy drives it over the bar. A score by Bill Hennessy, extending Kilkenny's lead to three points in the sixth minute of the second half. Looking for the equalising score, played inside, it's Eddie O'Connor is there first. Mistake's been made, but it's, uh, as you'd expect in finals. That's Liam Burke, and making a great save is Michael Welsh, making amends as well, and Pat O'Neill lifts the siege. And a 
again, great play here by Galloway and uh, you see Michael Walsh here, brilliant save. Dustin Campbell there against Willie O'Connor, instead it's Michael Phelan who goes back, followed it all the way, made it his, down towards Adrian Ronan. Paul Cooney trying to get it out, this is John Power, John Power 45 metres out and that's a lovely score! A first point for John Power. Eddie O'Connor letting the ball run away to Michael Phelan. Corey Kelly dashing in there, looking for a score, and he's put it over, and they're level yet again. It would be very hard luck at this stage if either of these teams was to lose it. Adrian Ronan running on for it against Paul Cooney, getting in his shot nonetheless. Ball in towards PJ Delaney to finish off this tie. Well, again, Adrian Ronan does very well here. Under pressure from the Galway defence, knocks in a very high ball. PJ Delaney gets, sees it going in over the defender's head, gets in right behind him, and beats the advancing goalkeeper. One-handed knocks in a tremendous goal by PJ Delaney. Towards Bill Hennessy. Cross towards Adrian Ronan, runs on instead to DJ Carey. Trying to open up the play. PJ Delaney had spotted away on the far side. That's good. Does well to go by. And he's fired it over to lead by four points and the match is in injury time Kilkenny looking for title number 25 McCarthy has it it runs on to DJ Carey 20 metres out and that's another all of a sudden it's all Kilkenny PJ Delaney has been replaced by Christy Heffernan just to give Christy a piece of the action Ollie calling for one last effort from his team Liam Burke onto it but uh, Flicked away very intelligently by Pat Dewar, showing great skill. The final piece of action, it's all over. Kilkenny retained the title. And Liam Keown wants to hold on to the ball as his little souvenir. Well, what a tie it turned out to be. Galway giving it everything. Kilkenny coming back magnificently. Midway through the second half, we were down and struggling, but uh, two great occasions. Eddie O'Connor made a famous speech that day and about the players getting a holiday and being looked after, properly looked after. Um, that was 1993, we're 10 years later, and now we're only getting probably, the players are probably only getting what we should rightfully get then. Kilkenny had a good win over Clare in the 95 league final, but were well beaten in the Leinster final by Offaly. All Ireland champions Wexford were the favourites going into the 97 Leinster final. It's Charlie Carter. Jerkush has been really taken way out of position this afternoon. That's a great score. Charlie Carter's first point. Larry O'Gorman option as well. Oh, a terrible ball straight to Peter Barry. Miss hit it, however. Eugene Furlong has lost it as well. Charlie Carter in after it. A series of errors here. And in front of goal. and now it looks a great deal better for Kilkenny just when Wexford should have had a chance at the other end and probably should have put it over the bar Kilkenny have come back and stolen a march on their great old rivals the face of Liam Dunn from Aulart the Ballot Wexford champions twice in recent years down it goes in towards Billy Byrne with his first touch can he score? But I couldn't quibble with the second half. I thought Wexford, uh, Wexford sorted out the problems that were there in the first half from their perspective. Their defence tightened up. They started to get a grip in midfield and really our defence found it difficult uh, to cope, although they did, I must say in fairness, very good in the circumstances. That year saw the start of the backdoor system. You could go back in and play again in the qualifiers, climb in and we had a fantastic game against uh, Galway and Torres. Uh, probably one of the greatest games I've been involved in. Now. Michael Phelan, DJ Carey! 
buzz of expectation when he gets it. Carries it on and he scores! Oh, super good. We showed glimpses like during the first half when he got away, got the run on the team and opened up a big score. Like. I can recall going in that there was a number of Kilkenny people begging for blood. Uh, and uh, you can, you know, a few of us were certainly uh, not being greeted in the most pleasant manner going in. But like DJ came out in the second half, and I was involved myself in the second half, and we kind of shook it up a bit. And Galway were young that day. To the unmarked Andy Comerford. Huge one downfield. DJ's in there waiting. A goal! DJ Carey. Brilliant. This is a superb match. DJ's got 2 5. Time to jump for joy again. All of a sudden, just two points between them. Again, it's picked up here. Charlie Carter. Still soloing forward. Nicely in for Phelan. They've got another! Kilkenny are in front. It's just one of those things that happens. I think uh, Kilkenny is renowned for, uh, for, for for making comebacks anyway, and maybe it is something that's uh, that's bred into us maybe as hurlers in Kilkenny. I'm not sure, but uh, but that was one day where we uh, we certainly redeemed ourselves big time in the second half. We can't understand this bird cage. That's what I call it, bird cage. And then they have a plaster across the nose, right? What's this for? How to keep the nostrils open or what? But uh, then the gloves made it all. The first I see wearing one of them was DJ. DJ and Carey. Well, what we can't understand now. I, I, oh, I see a match with Kilkenny up there. Who would have played? And DJ ran in 50 yards nearly from the middle of the field with the ball the whole way and tapped it into the net. And then, oh, my Jesus. So, so that's not, you know what I mean? You, you won't do it in rugby, will you? You hardly do it in soccer. That's hard that I tell you, the goalie in soccer to be, to be often bowled over, don't it? Kilkenny played Galway in Turles in what was a, 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 a truly epic game of real quality hurling. You know, Galway raced into a massive lead and Kilkenny came back and DJ was on fire and they played fantastic hurling. And they beat Galway in the end. And, but it was at the end of a truly great... It was probably the game of the year nearly that year as far as beautiful textbook holding was concerned. It was, it was a game you could show again and again to anybody. And we went into Kilkenny, uh, play Kilkenny in, in Croke Park, and we just blew them off the field in the first half. With, I suppose, the, the, the 35 minutes of best hurling that we ever played, probably. I remember Adrian Rona was in goals, and Eddie O'Connor, of course, being such a wish, was there playing cornerback. And uh, it, someone said something to Adrian Ronan, and Ronan said, what did he say? And Eddie O'Connor turned around to him and he said, don't bother fucking it out. Clear was so dominant. Impression at centre half forward. Good movement here, O'Connor, let's be across here. Chance for Higgerty. Oh, it's stopped, it comes back out to the sparrow, and it's finished. What a great start for Clare. Meanwhile, the Clare captain, Anthony Daly, straight at Philly Larkin. Moves away from the would-be challenge. Good ball in, high and over the bar. Exactly what the casts have required. DJ Carey trying to advance. Still DJ on the ground, great ball to Charlie Carter. Brian Lowen getting back goal side. Charlie to take it at him. The angle awkward, but he makes little of it. And it's a wonderful score by Charlie Carter, his first of this match. That's PJ Delaney goes down to DJ Carey. Getting away from Daly. Still DJ. That's what they needed. And Kilkenny are back in this. And it's taken the brilliant DJ Carey to get it for them. He's a different sort of player to everybody else. He's, uh, his eye and his, his vision and he'd have actually my uh, positional sense and the whole lot, he'd have that read before you have it read yourself. He'd know where to come into, he'd exactly know what the, what the whole lot was going on. And I suppose people didn't realise that DJ, he was, he's a lot hardier than people imagine. In 98, Kilkenny reversed the 95 Leinster final result against Offaly. Offaly boys early in this match, great block down, superb by Kevin Martin, cleared by Michael Zeigner. Up towards Willie O'Connor and Darren Hannafy. Coming through with John Troy. He faces Joe Gavinay. Goal number one by the maestro from Lesma in County Offaly. Barry 
Wheelahan underneath it. Two Kilkenny forwards chasing after him. Here's Kevin Keenan. Gets it inside to Charlie Carter. Ugly defense exposed. Charlie! The sides are level. Within the space of 24 seconds. Kilkenny rejoice. What John Troy can do at one end. You ask who could finish here? Charlie Carter can. My guess is <laughs> he'll put it over the bar. Judging by the stance. And again he goes for the goal. And again is it in? The umpire signals. Well, DJ Carey can only be described as a genius because, like me, I think the awfully defence anticipated by his stance that he was going to take his point. Waterford had been making good progress under Gerald McCarthy, even if losing the Munster final. And they met Kilkenny in the All Ireland semi final. Andy Comerford should be the first score of the match, and it is. Finally, after over five minutes play, DJ Carey in there with the challenge. Undergast coming after it in his debut match. Miss hits it somewhat, hit it into the ground, took the sting off it, and Landers makes the save in the clearance. Back by Philly Larkin. Here's Charlie Carter. Man of it all, Kilkenny scores the last day in the Leinster final, and he's off the mark here with a simply brilliant score. DJ Carey. Oh, a great stop. They're in after it again. Landers gets it away the second time. Best save of the match so far. Might have been the first goal of the game. It's out by Stephen Frampton. Only as far as Brian McAvoy. And he's put it over the bar. Wonderful skill. Great excitement. DJ Carey's about to take the free inside the 45 metre line. Just one free successfully converted from five so far. Will this be the first point of the second half? DJ hits it in low. PJ Delaney's after it. And it's a goal! Niall Maloney! In the fourth minute of the second half. A real lift for the Kilkenny fans. Hoping to see their side be far more explosive and dynamic in front of goal. DJ hit it low, deliberately so it seems, in there into the inside forward line and Maloney got onto it quickly. Watch the number 14 coming across here, hitting it well and sweeping it beyond Brendan Landers. The 1998 All-Ireland saw the unusual pairing of two Leinster teams in the final. Offaly were the underdogs as they had lost the Leinster final a few weeks earlier to Kilkenny. Pressure applied once again here. Joe Errity this time. Errity going in like a train. But a steamroll is going through and he scored! It's a goal for Offaly. Kenny O'Shea here taking his chance. Martin Hannum is after him. He hits it and he hits it well. That's two points now in this match for Ken O'Shea. He'll be delighted. They're absolutely thrilled. Three between them once again. Also notice there that John Ryan has come in in place of Johnny Dooley for Offaly. So lots of changes and switches very, very late in the matches. Both teams try to turn it their way. John Troy, nicely on towards John Ryan. Nicely in here towards Erity, the man who got the goal earlier on. Coming forward again, missing it this time. And it's a goal! Brian Whelan has done it! Brian Whelan has made it 2.15 to 113 with two minutes to go. 98 was unusual because it was the first year that a, a, a beaten Leinster finalist or a beaten provincial finalist came back into it and actually awfully turned it around and, and, and beat us in the All-Ireland final. So that was, you know, reasonably hard to take uh, in, in some ways, you know, that we had beaten them already. Would I like to be in a Kilkenny man? Um, would I like to have been born in a county like this? And I have to say, I probably would. I probably would have been liked to be involved in a place that loved the game that I love so much. Because my people in Wexford don't love this game as much as, 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 as I think they actually say they do, because if they did we would be better than we are. And that's not a disrespect for my own people, because they're trying to love everything. They're trying to love football and hurling, and they're trying to satisfy all masters. And that's the difference. Kilkenny do not satisfy all masters. And why should they? You know, why should they? 
And it drives me mad when fellas say, like, oh, sure, don't play football, but sure, Nick Faldo doesn't play, play tennis. Too many counties talk a good story without actually delivering it on the ground. Ultimately, it's about getting down into the field, getting organised, getting good people to look after your development squads, your underage teams, and making sure that that process is carried out and carried out in a professional manner uh, to an agreed standard, and, uh, and I think then counties can deliver more. Surprised by Offaly in the 98 final, Kilkenny were in the right frame of mind for the 1999 Leinster final. Work here by Brian McAvoy. McAvoy been given an advantage, represents play on. He does, he belts it and he whips it over the bar. Brian McAvoy had a very good start to the All-Ireland final on Brian Wheelahan has got the first point of the match here. There was a jersey pulled there, I think, by Henry Shefflin on Kevin Martin. Here's John Parr, stepping in beautifully, going around Keenahan. Opportunities, DJ Carey, a goal opportunity, and it's there! DJ Carey, who else? 20 minutes gone. The first goal of the game. Kilkenny have looked the more likely to score goals in this match. Brian McAvoy. DJ's in after it. And he's buried it! DJ Carey's second goal of the first half, and it's 3 7 to 8 points. It was ominous once that ball was raining in there in front of Stephen Byrne. Martin Hanami there as well, but look at the flick here. Beautifully done by DJ Carey. Eamon Kennedy getting it back downfield towards Ken O'Shea. This time it's taken away by Simon Wheelerham. Brian McAvoy here. Support outside through Ken O'Shea, going right through the defence once more. Still McAvoy, oh, it's ended up in the back of the net. Another Kilkenny goal, what a day. Four minutes into the second half. And virtually Kilkenny's second attack, and it produces a fourth goal. Comerford having difficulty getting it onto his stick. Not the uh, Offaly crowd's favourite, for obvious reasons. Ken O'Shea winning that one. DJ with a lovely hand pass to Henry Shefflin. It's a kick. End of the comeback, if there were ever was to be one. The semi-final against Clare was a repeat of the 97 clash at the same stage, which Clare had won easily. Well, here is the big man himself, full back in last year's All-Ireland final. Disappointment that day for Kilkenny. It's his 25th championship match. And a huge one from O'Neill. Dropping it right in there towards John Paul. Runs on, Kenny A goal in the very first minute. What a start. Ken O'Shea. A dream start for Kilkenny, and that after about 40 seconds play. Well, straight from that huge free from Pat O'Neill, which wasn't dealt with properly by the Clare backs. And today, Clare set up an awful lot more chances than Kilkenny as we watch this one draw in there and taken by the goalkeeper David Fitzgerald out towards Anthony Daly. John Power knocked back and pushed over the bar. That's the score that Kilkenny requires. It comes from John Power. And they do so. Barry Murphy pushed by Kenneth Brennan inside here. Colin Lynch will move forward. There's a chance for McNamara. It's wrapped it's a goal! Stephen McNamara, he's made a habit of getting goals in critical moments, in crisis situations. He's done so again. 17 minutes into the second half. Now look at the scoreline. Just a point in it. McNamara once again, but Lynch was involved. A balancing act by the number 13 to beat McGarry. It's tense. Brian Cody was the word there for Dennis Byrne, the man about to take the sideline ball. I think both managers are probably living on their nerves right now. So are all the fans. Place in the final against Cork at stake. 
beautifully in, and DJ carries in the clear. Oh, it's a great goal! Only DJ could do that. We 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 set a big standard going through uh, Leinster, and we disposed of uh, Clare in the All Ireland semi-final, and gave a great exhibition. And we didn't bring that form to Croke Park to play a young Cork team that day and I suppose the wishes day an all Ireland final was ever played. The 99 final against Cork in wet conditions was a poor low-scoring game. Mark Landers from Killa making a point for Cork, no score for Kilkenny. Good vision here by Fergal McCormack to find Mark Landers. Saw him out of the top corner of his eye, I'm sure. He got away Landers from Comerford, and that's the first score. Henry Shefflin and DJ Carey have switched in the last couple of seconds. DJ now is in at full forward. That's Henry contesting. This is John Carr. Head forward to the young man with the green helmet. And he swung this one in beautifully and has put it over the bar. A switch working straight away. That move to bring Shefflin out to right half forward and he's got his third point, the first from play, and the sides are level. That's a wonderful catch by Peter Barry. Wonderful skill. Inside to Andy Comerford. Just getting enough latitude now to get away from Alan Brown. He's flagging somewhere as Comerford takes it forward on his left hand side. That's a tremendous score. And Andy Comerford special. Two points in the match for Andy. Every time Cork come back and get within a couple of points, Kilkenny have the facility to come back and widen the gap once more. Three to three, here's Timmy McCarthy. Andy Comerford chases after him. The young man from North Cork to Joe Dean. Running in there to the challenge of Peter Barry. Hand pass to Ben O'Connor. Looking for enough room. Gets enough room. Gets enough accuracy on it as well. And Cork take the lead through Ben O'Connor. His first point of the match. Fergal McCormick still running, still chasing. McAvoy still dominating. Inside there it goes towards the substitute. DJ Delaney trying to get enough room. Inside towards DJ. DJ Carey trying to run into the goal. It was very close indeed, but it's gone wide. Hard to imagine the DJ has failed to score this afternoon, but here he was coming through. It took a lot of steps. In the end, it was uh, blocked down in there. And the final chance going into the side netting. Now it's at the discretion of the referee how much time he's going to allow on. Here's Dennis Byrne. Still only a point in it. They're coming kind of looking for a chance, but the referee has whistled. It's all over. And Cork are the All Ireland hurling champions for 1999. 17 minutes or 18 minutes to go in the game, we were leading by four points, and it was a day when scores were very hard to come by. And, you know, we were in a decent position, but Cork got five unanswered points in the last 17 minutes or so, and uh, they won the game. And they didn't steal the game, they won the game, because, in my opinion, the best team in all Ireland finals always win the game, because it's only there to be won, and you, you've got to do what you have to do to, to win it, and they did that. And, you know, there's no way, I suppose, thinking back, you'd be saying, you wouldn't be happy with surrendering a four-point advantage. If they had to get a goal, fair enough, you'd say, right, or back in the game. But they didn't. They pegged it back, pegged it back, pegged it back. And it was a rotten day for us in Crow Park. Cork in 99 was a real killer because we were four or five points up on that occasion. I know it was a bad day, but it was bad for both teams. But we were well up, going OK. Cork came back, literally, and, and beat us with points. It wasn't that they got two goals to beat us in the last few minutes. They actually got points. And... Uh, we didn't, we didn't score for the last 10 or 11 minutes, and that was a real, real killer. Kilkenny have put a new development policy in place for their underage players. Subsequent to being defeated by Offaly, the county chairman, Ned Quinn, uh, in fairness to him, he, he brought in a number of, uh, of key, key people within the county and uh, set this uh, process in, in, in motion, whereby there was development squads at uh, various levels from 14 up to 17. You were first of all improving the skill of players. You were probably bringing players into an environment where they hadn't been uh, involved in such organised coaching in their own clubs. Some obviously had, but maybe some of them didn't have. So they were learning a, a, a level of discipline about training that they hadn't got before. 
you were also identifying key players going forward that were likely to make it. Uh, you were also probably building a level of discipline to how they should behave as individuals and whatnot. And of course, they were getting a little reward like a t-shirt or something like that to identify them as being part of a developmental squad. Everything in Kilkenny is based on the parish. So for primary schools, it's the schools of the parish form the team. The clubs took ownership of all the schools in the sense of supplying them with gear, paying their bills and so on. Anybody looking after a primary school team is guaranteed two tickets at Kilkenny or in the All Ireland final. And that's a major carrot. Any child in any school in Kilkenny should be able to get um, Hurley, Hermit or Slitter at a reasonable price. We run class leagues in the city, which means that every able bodied man in the class puts a jersey on. And the night of the finals, you'd have parents, but particularly mothers again, outside in Nolan Park Centre. Sir, please give me a minute. And you try, if at all possible, to give everybody some couple of minutes. Because with some children, they'll never put a jersey on again. It's something that'll stick their minds for the rest of their lives, maybe not in your mind or my mind. And they become the great supporter. They're the person who puts their hand in their pocket. And at the end of the day, they're very often the person who keeps the show on the road. The 2000 Leinster final was the third meeting in a row between Kilkenny and Offaly. Back to Gary Hadithy once again. The big man coming in on the 40 and he strikes it over the bar. There's Two points for Gary Hadithy. Some magnificent hurling going on at the moment. You feel like they deserve a timeout, but then you don't want them to have it. You want them to just keep going at this fantastic rate. Wonderfully fit players, wonderfully talented hurlers, and Charlie Carter is nipping in, and Charlie has put it into the back of the net. Superb goal again. What a response, 11 minutes into the second half. Charlie with a goal and three points. And Charlie Carter got a goal and three points last year as well. DJ was there, but Charlie was backing up, taking plenty of steps, mind you. John Parr. Everybody after him. And still he feeds it inside towards Stephen Graham. This time to Dennis Byrne. That is absolutely brilliant. And that's John Power's point again, there's no question. He can look at the middle of the field to win that. That is brilliant. Wonderful finish, of course. He went out here near our commentary position, worked his socks off, played it inside. The return ball given out there to Dennis Byrne, whose striking was super. Galway were in a reasonably good position until just after half time in the semi final. Passing it inside for Andy Donovan. Going right through. Here's a chance for Kilkenny. A goal! Nine minutes gone. Andy Comerford's goal. He went right through that time. Doesn't score too many goals, but he's done it here superbly in his 16th championship match. The hand pass coming in from Steve, Stephen Graham, on for Comerford. Great movement, great power, great accuracy. He's lucky this time in that Philly Larkin appreciated the peril he was in. Brian McAvoy. Huge one up towards DJ Carey. Always good for a goal. He's got a winner. DJ Carey. Tell me he's not a genius. Three minutes of the second half gone. DJ Carey rips it into the back of the net. That's his 28th ever goal in championship hurling. The man is a master. Tuck it down here. Always causing problems for the back. And he buried it. Having lost two finals in a row, Kilkenny had no intention of becoming the first team in the county's history to lose three in a row. Ready to take off, ready to cut loose. Falling, striking, but pulling it over the bar. Henry Shefflin from Shamrocks, and Kilkenny have made the best possible start. Up towards Joe Dooley, it beats him however, not so Philly Larkin. Back in towards Henry Shefflin, three against two in there. Cappy fumbles, DJ's on his way, DJ Carey, great goal! Only six minutes gone, DJ Carey was anticipating, showed lightning pace, and a dashing finish down towards Andy Comerford, battling in there with Ger Oakley. 
picked up here by Brendan Murphy. He's a really pacey player, but that's Brian McAvoy. First time we've seen him in the match. That'll do his confidence a lot of good. Here they come with John Hoyne. Surprise choice inside for Henry Shatler. Bearing it in goal again. Stopped on the line, and it's in. DJ. DJ and Henry Shatler were close at hand. Joe Arity contesting with Henry Shefflin, and here comes DJ Carey. DJ Carey, oh, saved, and it's whipped in in the end, and it's another goal, and it's Charlie Carter this time. Three goals in the first half, scored by each and every one of the inside forwards. This one coming after 32 minutes. DJ was racing forward. That's a great strike, good save, but punished by Charlie Carter. Out to Kenneth Brennan, the army man. It's a huge one down towards Henry Shefflin. Can they get another one here? Henry's in, and Henry has scored. I was just about to say, Kenneth Brennan has demanded to give him quick and early ball. He delivers his first big ball back in the net. That's a great goal by Henry Shefflin. Simon Whelan trying to deflect it away. Here comes Eddie Brennan. Here's another one. It's all over now. I told you he was a wonderful player. He was unlucky not to be on this team. It's a day for winners. Willie O'Connor takes the Liam McCarthy Cup. You know, we were massively determined. The players were, were hugely determined. They, no way they were going to let it be said that we were going to lose three finals in a row because we were a very, very good team, great players in it. And we played well on the day. We, we got into the game very early and, and we had a great victory that day. The All-Ireland champions were in devastating form in the 2001 Leinster final. Going by Colin Keogh. This is ominous. Good save. But it's in the back of the net. Good save, Joe, but DJ got the rebound, and no better man than DJ doesn't miss chances like that. Good run by Henry Shefflin, coming right in, taking the finger on going around him. Great save, but the rebound goes to DJ, and he won't miss that. There's John Hoyne, seems to have switched inside to full forward. Here comes Brian McAvoy, and McAvoy over the bar. And and that's a great point by Brian McAvoy. And they get that ball inside Joe, they're very, very fast and very active. For, from Burnley to the ball, they've got a lot of scores, but very, the ball isn't going up. The Kilkenny half back on midfield are not on top, like, you know, and they have to very hard to get the ball in there. Free for all situation, tidied in the end by Noel Hickey. Very good full back. McAvoy into space, Shefflin chasing after it. Oh, here's Shefflin, turning it back nicely. An opportunity, and it's another goal. In the semi final, Kilkenny were unable to find that Leinster final form against Galway. Taken away by Kevin Broderick. The pacey Broderick. It's like it's an egg and spoon race. He's taking it forward adventurously. Lovely skill getting it over Kennedy. And what a oh, point. Gerard, that is fantastic. He has travelled 45 yards. 37 to 47. They went that period of Northern Ireland. 47 to 57. They went that period of Northern Ireland. But... They weren't really down. They were very close to the pace of the game. They were still very close to the to the to the cog of the or to the the driving force at the centre of the wheel. And even seventies, and you said they went down, they were back up in eighty two, eighty three. But they were still only getting to semi finals. How did they do it? Very patiently, very methodically, with great clarity and great planning. In two thousand and two, Kilkenny were under pressure to make up for that poor display against Galway the previous year. Ling's shot has gone over the bar. What a great run by the man from Emeralds. Here comes Barry Lambert. How they could do to score. Played inside towards Mitch Jordan. Philly Larkin coming out to meet him. It's Mitch Jordan again. There's a goal chance here. And it's uh, gone out for the 65. The save made by James McGarry. I'm sure the Wexford crowd here, here in their thousands, felt that that was going to slip in past the goalkeeper and be buried right in the back of the net, but it was a very good save. An inviting one in there. That's a great catch. Well, this man is having a blinder. Declan Roof marshalling that Wexford defence. Comes back towards Henry Shefflin, however, and Henry Shefflin has showed Wexford how it's done. We didn't score any goals on the day, and um, <clears throat> it was a high point scoring game. But uh, Breen made a few substitutes and I was taking off myself the, the same day things were looking kind of dodgy at the end of it, you know, and, and, and we came back and I think we, hit, we scored two points near the end of it, scraped through. 
all rivals Tipperary were the opposition in the semi-final. It was the first time in, in, since 69, I think it was, that Kilkenny were playing, playing tip, so there was a big hype about it. And, uh, of course, DJ was after making his return. There's pressure on, Ger. It's over the bar, and that is the 250th point in DJ Carey's inter-county career. Huge one up towards Martin Comfort, leaving it behind there, towards Eddie Brennan, taking possession once again and trying to be in command of the situation, and he is... ...jostling in midfield already. 35 minutes to go to determine which of these teams will be playing Clare in a few weeks' time in the Guinness All-Ireland hurling final. And this looks like a very good start to the second half for Kilkenny. John Hoyne with his first point. First attack, producing the lead for the Cats. Oh, that's a great catch by J.J. Delaney from the Fenians. In over the head of Martin Comerford this time, waiting for assistance to arrive. Eddie Brennan would like to score two points in rapid succession. Noel Morris can't take it up, it's DJ Carey instead. Still has that lightning pace, getting away from Costello. Big roll from the crowd, and the reason is the white flag. Three points for DJ Carey. Beyond Conor Gleeson this time, still warming up in this particular match. Comes out to Brian O'Mara. Two men are after him, Malali is one of them. Michael Kavanaugh going out as well. Passes too long, however. Chance to retrieve. Hit inside by Eugene O'Neill. What a start! And it's in! Nice balance and control here. Beautifully taken by Martin Comerford, who's just made that switch, as you heard. Great work again here by DJ Carey, taking on Costello. It's still DJ Carey, will he go the whole way through? Laying it off, and the sub has scored! Jimmy Coogan's first real chance of making a major impact. There are 24 minutes of the second half gone. Kilkenny sweep into the lead, and it's DJ who made it. Might have gone through himself, and where he might be hooped, they were all after him, and Coogan belted it into the net past Brendan Cummins. Kilkenny met Clare in the final. This was their first meeting in the final since 1932. Clare were after coming a, a, a very tough route, you know, to the final. Uh, they came through the back door, and, and uh, Clare being Clare, you know, they weren't going to go down without a fight. Richie Mullally, great take. Nicely down here towards Henry Shefflin. What a battle he's going to have with Sean McMahon. It's starting already. Thundering forward, looking for the opening score. It's a goal! Beautiful cross ball. Henry Seven got across and DJ just tapped it down into the net. What a start that is. DJ Carey with yet another championship goal and only three minutes are gone. Brian Lawn having his difficulties there at times with Martin Comerford. And that's Eddie Brennan. And Brennan has hit it and he's put it over the bar. Dublin based Scarda Eddie Brennan plays for the Greg Valley Callan Club the defiant fist thing there I think saying to his colleagues come on we can do it but it was when Lone was beaten and the ball wasn't cleared properly Brennan was in into the corner another surging run here by Eddie Brennan great play John Hoyne is there as a Jimmy Coogan I think it's Coogan who's got it DJ Carey, the Dodger himself. After him there was Ollie Baker, DJ steadying himself, turning it in beautifully and putting it over the bar, and he's now got a goal and four points. That's a fantastic score, Jerry. Couldn't catch it again. He had taken it twice in his hand, and he's a genius no matter what to say. You just won't replace this guy. Can you know what's this? He's, he can't catch it again. Just steadies up, rattles it off the cuff. A beautiful score on the volley, fantastic. Five shots by DJ, five scores. 
So what can Clare do? Not an awful lot right now. Did Kenny once again, after slackening their influence on the game, have come back? But here is Brian Lowen, one man who never lets the side down. Not a great pass. Brian McAvoy, first touch, first chance. I'm just to make an impact, and he does it instantly. Great point by Brian McAvoy. 170 to 13 points. This is Richie Mullally. Kilkenny deny that point a little while ago, which they felt they might just get. Back there is Brian Lowen, partly blocked. Swept inside, dangerous ball, Shefflin! Henry Shefflin, 28 minutes gone in the second half. And that should be enough yep. to secure the title for the Cats. That's a goal and seven points now for Henry Shefflin. Martin Comerford played it across the face of the goal. Lovely, well-timed run. And Shefflin buries it. I don't think there's much in it. The referee is calling for the ball. It's all over. Kilkenny are very deserving champions. Well, we got a great start. Fiji got a goal early on, and, and we were playing well right throughout the field. Um, you know, right throughout the field, a lot of uh, middle of the forwards, our backs were, were excellent as well, right through, and, and midfield was strong. Um, again, we had huge determination that day, I suppose. We had lost the previous semi final, and the team had been together for a while, and also we had brought in some new blood as well. Well, what a day for Andy. Man who came back from London, kissing the cup. Taking it proudly home. If you take, say, the All-Ireland winning Kilkenny senior team of 2002, um, I think there was 11 of that 15 were past pupils of Kieran's. From about the late 20s, early 30s, Kieran started to develop a tradition of hurling, even though, funnily enough, it was originally a rugby school until the mid-20s. There was no win between 1975 and 1988. But then things really happened. For the first time ever, Kieran's won two in a row, 88 and 89, and then won three in a row in 1990. Lost out in the final in 91 and won the next two. So they won five out of six and were beaten in the sixth final. And that was the beginning, really, of a golden era in the late 80s and 90s. And we, we are really lucky in Kieran's in that there's a network of excellent primary schools around the county who have a lot of very dedicated primary school teachers, male and female, doing a lot of work. And probably our tradition is such now in Kieran's that the best of the, those young hurlers want to come to Kieran's because tradition naturally follows on. But then when they come into us, you know, the hard work has to be done. And we are lucky we have a dedicated band of anything up to 10, 12, 14 teachers who put in an awful lot of hard work. And then, of course, there is the backing of the school authorities as well. And I think it's fair to say that we have a bit of a tradition here that we try to inculcate into the lads that, you know, discipline and hurling on and off the field is very important but also discipline in your studies. To actually crown a career, cap a career, and it's brilliant uh, more so when you've had a career and coming towards whatever you know end is coming, and, and I hope that won't be for a couple of years. But if, if I was to win and captain a team at 21, I don't think it's the same. The old rivals Wexford with the opposition in the Leinster final. Plenty of atmosphere. Still very noticeable around the place, and here come the Cats looking for a goal, and get one, and it's Eddie Brennan. First minute of the second half. Still coming through, Connor Phelan. Dropping short, but dangerously so, and it's Henry Shefflin, who might have put that out of Wexford's reach. That's the thing, Gerard, they're doing this the whole day. It's a ball that walked up, their midfield is very strong, Peter Barry caught a high ball, and... No better man than Shefflin just to flick it into the back net. Just watch it here. It comes, it's out in the air. It's coming a long, long way down. But Shefflin comes in from the side. Just a touch in the back of the net. And there we go again. They're back to the six, seven points. Nicky Brennan, a former Kilkenny star himself, presenting the Bob O'Keefe Cup, this wonderful trophy for the Leinster champions. Champions once again are Kilkenny. DJ Carey taking the cup. And it's all about attitude. And they have a hurling attitude. And I don't, I think they've got the purest hurling attitude in the land and I think that's what makes them different than anybody else in the land. If Kilkenny were to win two in a row they would have to overcome Tipperary and Cork in the last two games of the championship. 
Eddie Brennan came onto it to snatch it and put it over. Walsh knocking it ahead here towards Martin Comerford. Opening it out towards Henry Shefflin at right half forward. Shefflin striking, missed the last one, not this one. He's put it over the bar. Kilkenny once again trying to set up an attack here through Martin Comerford. Going for it himself. Bounces off the stick of Brendan Cummins. They're all in after it. Henry Shefflin anticipating. Trying to turn it around. Back here it comes towards John Hoyne on his left-hand side. Between the posts and over. In terms of scoring chances, not much between them. Tipperary have created 20 scoring chances. Kilkenny have created 18, 10-9 on the score. And it is Paul Kelly hitting it from some distance and over. That's a fantastic one, Gerald. Great way to play with Paul Kelly. He's always doing that. He shoots up to midfield and has a goal. Huge free. Pressure on the backs. Coin coming in. Brennan ever available. Still dangerous. Goal! It's coming for a while, Gerald. Eddie Just Brennan, third time of asking, has whipped it into the back of the net, mercilessly beyond Brendan Cummins. Going back there to claim possession is Derek Ling. Huge one in, everybody's after it. Cummins drops it, Brennan's after it, Shefflin comes back on the stick of the post, comes out to Tommy Walsh. The shot comes back this time off Paul Curran, still it's Kilkenny. And it's stopped again by Cummins, comes out to Walsh. What a sequence, what a save again. Back to Walsh again, and it's a goal! by Tommy Walsh forward here for Paddy Mullally up towards Henry Shefflin Shefflin stayed inside waited and scored good night Tipperary and we're looking around for possible switches and changes from the early stage and I've noticed that Comerford and uh, Dermot O'Sullivan are on one another the previous 18 meetings in the final between the two leading hodling counties had Kilkenny ahead with 11 wins to Cox 7. And straight away it's Tommy Welsh here. 65 metres out from the court goal looking to give his side the lead and he's done it! What a start! First attack, first point. There was a doubt about him. But he showed no effects of any hip injury with that beautifully hit uh, point. Dowling under pressure. Peter Barry's there to help out of the half-back line. It's been a magnificent half-back line by Kilkenny, and they have a great sense of togetherness. Comerford, very rangy player, very selfless player, taking on Wayne Sherlock. Turning, striking, and he has scored. Usually gets just about a point a game, Martin Comerford, but he's a great leader of the attack. Good play here. That's a fine effort by Derek Ling. Great point by Ling. Raises the white flag, and that's wonderful play when you can see a midfielder coming in, taking the responsibility, and snapping it over. James Ryle, not standing his ground, and once again it's a down to Hopin, and he scores! Santa Claus has delivered Joe, he's trapped in all day. 18 minutes into the second half. Satanto Halpin with his third goal in the championship. His first score of the day here. Denied a point earlier on because it was wide. But this time, no question or doubt about it. And he fires it in. And he's put the team's level for the second time. Andy Comerford waiting for the break to come his way, didn't do so. Derek Ling has it. Spoons it outside to Henry Shefflin. Kilkenny needing scores. That's great play by Shefflin. Breaking the hearts of the court backs once again. Five points for Shefflin. Good ball inside, intended for Conor Phelan. Runs on to Henry Shefflin. Kilkenny have a man over. It's Martin Comerford. He balances and he strikes. And he scores! The crucial goal of the game. into the second half and the Cork defence was in a dither and the disarray was punished in emphatic style by Martin Comerford. Dermot O'Sullivan is running forward to Joe Dean 
Here he is into the equation. Trying to steamwalk all his way through. Stopped by Peter Barry. Kilkenny with possession. And Kilkenny with the title. The champions have retained the McCarthy Cup. I think it's an absolute dream come true that very few and even I couldn't have dreamt about it. I didn't prepare, I didn't prepare any speech because he can't do it. He can't be prepared until you walk up those steps. And now Kilkenny complete the double double. And Kilkenny Oz O'Creorum and Cotton and Brunner and Captain Kilkenny. Ireland's greatest, Kilkenny's hero, the legend from Goran, DJ Carey. As DJ Carey raised the McCarthy Cup in the presence of loyal fans, the country could rest assured, because the national game is always safe, and the McCarthy Cup is decked in the black and amber of Kilkenny.